here on YouTube, answering any and all of your questions about, well, anything about anything, really. <laughs> it can be about photography. I have a box of Canon latest RF stuff here, like the 100 Macro and the R5, and as well as some old stuff, like the 135 2.8 Soft Focus. And I can answer any and all of your questions. If you'd simply just pop them into a comment, they will pop up here on my screen. Oh, look at this. This is what happens when you're an amateur here. I don't know if hair and makeup people, so too bad. Anyway, <laughs> of course, it'll take us a little while to get an audience. And the reason I'm so dark is, is I'm not standing out there in the sunshine. And I've done other live videos where I've showed you about how to do lighting. And hey, if I was professional talent, I wouldn't mind all the light shining in my face. But to be honest, to match daylight requires a lot of light. This is coming to you live, your KenRockwell.com, KenRockwell.tv. And it is being broadcast directly from my iPhone 13 Pro Max. Simply my iPhone 13 Pro Max is stuck in the table here. And I just went to the YouTube app and hit live and boom, here you go. So all we need is some questions. What can we cover here? What have I got here? What did, what did I bring in my magic bag? Here's an R5 with the newest 14 to 35 millimeter F4, which is great. Kind of like all the new mirrorless lenses, regardless of the manufacturer, Nikon, Canon, Sony, Fuji, they're all superb. It's not like the 1960s where lenses were sometimes crappy and you know, not always sharp. Oh, hi, John H. Yeah, John just put a comment in the comment section and I can see that live here, it pops up on the screen of my phone so I can answer your questions. What other goodies have I got? Here's the 100 macro for the RF system. And this is actually, it turns out now that I've got this lens, this ring here, there's a lock for it. This ring here is actually a soft focus ring. SA is spherical aberration. This is for soft focus. And I got curious. And for those of you new to all this is my website, kenrockwell.com, has all the real details on all this stuff. And explicit detail, YouTube is just for fun here because I can. That's actually, does exactly what this 19, this came out in 1987. It was one of the first lenses for the Canon autofocus system. Has a soft focus ring on it. And guess what? This soft focus ring, uh, hey, Chile. Hi, I've been to Peru. That's as close as I've gotten. Thanks, Bruce. This ring here is soft focus. Oh, Arizona, I love that. And it turns out that this lens does exactly the same thing as the soft focus setting on the Nike uh, Canon Macro. Strange but true. And actually, if you go to my website, kidrockwell.com, you'll see my news section. Just click the new button. I've got a review of the 135, and it's the same thing. Okay, we got a question from John. Quick question, when shooting a landscape, whereabouts should I be setting the focus point? You know, usually, and the next comment just came in New York City. Set the focus point about in the middle of your scene of stuff. And to be honest, you could make it really complicated. If you've got a big scene and there's nothing really in the beginning or not, hip hop for kids. Thank you, long time reader of my site. Just use a central focus point. Honestly, the central focus point alone is usually the best focus point because it's in the middle of the range between near and far. Uh, honestly, I usually shoot my cameras in automatic AF area select. So that it automatically selects what it thinks is the best AF area and it's usually the right one. I don't worry too much about it. In fact, in all of life and photography, people worry way too much about the wrong things and it distracts them from worrying about what's actually important, which is what's in your picture. See, where is my, where should I be focusing? If I look at my face here, that's not it. I love this. You're welcome, John. Ah, La Belle France, F. Stephen Ward. Any comments on the iPhone 13 Pro camera system? Well, you know, just like the whole world, I just got mine like a week or so ago. I'm loving it. What I really have to remark to myself is, is I don't know how on earth Apple could actually make it any better than the iPhone 12 Pro Max, which I had, but they did. Does the colors seem more vibrant? Or maybe it's because the stuff I shot just earlier this week, like on Thursday, what is today, Saturday? Two nights ago, I'm shooting at night and the images are just spectacular. It's kind of fun to watch the camera process it because you take your image and then when you go back and play it back, computational photography, okay, that's what I'm talking about right now. The iPhone 13, look at that crazy stuff here. Take an image at night and then when I actually come back to play it back, for about a fraction of a second, it's too dark. But in that fraction of a second, the magic that is Apple suddenly goes kaboom and everything lightens up and it looks spectacular. What's really crazy is, as I've said this before, is if you wanted to find a good camera or the value of a camera or the quality of the image of a camera and base it on how accurately does the photograph you get represent what you saw when you were there, and that doesn't mean necessarily good art, but 
If you want to define it that way, the iPhone is by far the world's best camera in that. In other words, anything from daylight to moonlight, even the Milky Way at night, when I snap it on my iPhone today, it looks like it did. Especially, for people talk about dynamic range and worry about, oh, I'm going to get a medium format camera to have larger dynamic range. Nah, because medium format cameras aren't as smart as what Apple puts in their iPhones. And when I photograph some really contrasty things, like when people make me take their pictures at noon in sharp, harsh summer summer direct sunlight and some people are wearing hats covering their face so their face are like this right now are in total shadow it's astounding that when i make a still image ah do i have a let me just pause here john h nikon z62 do i have a best setting tutorial yes i do go to kenrockwell.com click on reviews click on mirrorless click on z62 and then in there you click on the usage section and you will have my explicit review uh, excuse me my explicit user's guide to all my tricks and secrets of the Z7 Mark II, the Z6 Mark II. And here's another trick, or another secret, is most of the Nikon or Sony or Canon cameras are all very, very similar. So if you have a camera you'd like to know my tips for, and I don't have that, that much of a guide for it, or my guide is maybe a little thin, well, there's nothing wrong with looking at the similar cameras. Like the Z7 and the Z6 are the same camera, with just slightly different resolutions. Likewise, the Dash 2 versions are the same camera with a couple of new features put in. So if you read the user's guide for either one, you're gonna cover both cameras and honestly read the guide for the newer camera because that adds some features. So the stuff that your camera doesn't do, well, at least everything will still apply because as I learn more, I add it onto the newer reviews. So yes, the iPhone 13 is astonishing to me just in the week I've had it, especially at nighttime because the colors come out so vividly. Now, something that people don't talk about a lot is, or may not realize is, is the tricks behind what goes on in cameras, or one of the tricks that camera makers play is, is they don't use a lot of saturation at the super high ISOs. In fact, Nikon cameras used to cheat. Oh, look at this. <laughs> Nikon cameras would cheat. And what they, ooh, what if I rotated my phone by 180 degrees? Oh, I am so bad. I'm gonna rotate my phone 180 degrees so that I am looking at my camera. What happens if I do that? Operation is locked. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> I'm doing this through the YouTube app. Now, the funny thing is people get all excited about trying to hook up their computers and cameras and everything else to the live YouTube app. No, this is just working in the YouTube, YouTube's own app. I just hit the go live button and I tried to rotate, it wouldn't work. So what was I saying? In the olden days, Nikon cameras, when you set them to maybe the H1 or H2 ISOs, would actually no longer apply the picture controls and you'd lose the saturation settings and sharpness because they realized that there was so much noise it was gonna look crappy. And the iPhone now seems to give me full color even in the dark, which I really, really like. Now, I've had some comments come in here. Let's get this. A DA10 in 2021 was a good idea, Jezlov123 asks. Well, you know, it all depends what you want. If you want a great digital single lens reflex camera, yes, a DA10, DA10 is not the most recent but it's still a state-of-the-art camera with unbeaten image quality. Uh, look at my sample images. I shot my DA10 back when it was brand new, back around 20 teen something, and I used only my Nikon manual focus AIS lenses on it, with which it works great. In fact, if you want to shoot manual focus lenses, they work a lot better on the digital single lens reflex Nikons than they ever will on the mirrorless because the DSLRs actually have feelers and prokers to read all the data from the lens, so you actually get proper automatic exposure, proper EXIF data, proper automatic diaphragm control, none of which the FTZ adapter can do. So yeah, the DA-10 is awesome. And I love the images I shot. They're ultra, ultra sharp on there. Shot Route 66 with it. So yeah, if you want a top-end DSLR, by all means, the DA-10 is a bargain choice, and you'll probably never notice the difference between that and the 850. Okay, oh, my thumb. What you're seeing is my thumb. This is like being inside the TV here. I'm looking at my comments here. Okay, JP asks, and how far back is it? That was about 157, so I'm about two minutes behind. He bought his first real camera and he appreciates my reviews and links. Hey, JP, thanks for reading my stuff. You guys are the only reason I do this. And it, not admittedly, I was working in television getting paid for it since high school. And the fact now that I can pull this phone out of my pocket and do an instant live broadcast is a hoot. Yes, I actually put a tripod. I've got a tripod mount. What have I got? My open, oh, can we see this? Oh, oh, bear with me. Let me show you my tripod mount. Here's not a tripod mount. Oh, maybe I just hit the reverse button. This is all fun. Oh, cool, here we go. I've got an Obin CTT-1000. Will it focus? No, 
The iPhone camera certainly would focus, but this is actually being run through the YouTube app, so you're not getting the, anywhere the image quality that the iPhone will give you. Anyway, this is a carbon fiber tripod. These are about a foot long. And on it, I have my little uh, Oban, no, it's a, <laughs> my little Oban adapter here. Now, this one's all metal. What is it? It's an SPA. Is it gonna focus for us? Yes, it will. It's an SPA 1000. This is all metal. It's spring-loaded. It's got steel here. This, I think, is a permanent, a permanent investment. It's also got an Arca Swiss plate on the bottom. So unlike my Nikon FTZ, this little adapter will pop right in. And this open ball head comes included with the CTT-1000 tripod. Let's see, will it focus now? Come on, focus, focus, focus. Okay, sorry about that. And here I am again. And again, sorry that this is not the iPhone's native video app, it's the YouTube app, which doesn't have the access to the magic that the iPhone does. The iPhone would actually probably most would probably <laughs> would probably lighten my face and make it look great. That's what I love about my iPhone video, is it can work in any crappy light and makes it look great. And also, people don't realize, people get all excited about gimbals. My hair looks foolish. iPhone users get all excited about gimbals for doing YouTube and video. And actually, when you shoot the video, it looks fairly bumpy as you're shooting it looking on the screen. But as soon as you play it back, you realize it is immensely well stabilized. It is awesome. It's got electronic and optical and sensor shift, all those things work together, along with the accelerometers and the camera who know exactly what's going on more than any other camera does. And so I can take my iPhone and just walk it around. And when I play that back, it's like it was shot on rails. So again, I skip the gimbals for iPhone. Now let me look at some more of your comments. Where are we here? Greetings from Newcastle, UK. Greetings, it must be evening over there. Thanks so much for watching. I hope I can make this worthwhile for all of you guys. Okay, Heine asks, how do I regard the Zeiss T-Star lens coating using a few Sony co-branded lenses? Well, the T-Star coatings are just a brand name for multi-coating, which every camera maker and even every independent lens maker made standard in the 1970s. Back in the 1970s, that was what every lens had to have. Today, everybody's excited about mirrorless. Well, guess what? In the almost 200-year history of photography, there's always been something new that you just have to have. Otherwise, your pictures are going to be horrible, and they try to make you buy it. And in the 1970s, it was multi-coding. Everything was multi-coded, or MC. And T-Star is just a brand name for MC. Just like Leica calls an F2 lens a Summicron, which sounds really cool. All it means is Leica F2 lens. So likewise, the T-Star coatings are multi-coding. And here's the deal. Every lens is multi-coated today. These cheap guy glasses I got from Costco, they're multi-coated. How do you tell multi-coating? Single coating, when you look at the reflections, gosh, I can't show this, can I? Yeah, you see those reflections? You see how they're green? You see how those are green? That's multi-coated. Single coating will either be amber or much more commonly blue. And that was the single coated lenses, which are popular from about World War II until the 1970s. Today, everything's multi-coated and you'll see magenta and green in the reflections. And so I don't consider the, the T-Star multi-coating any different than every other lens available from every other manufacturer today, if that helps you. Camera stores, I, I haven't been to a camera store since the 70s, but if you remember the old camera stores, they would give people, ex try to lie to people and tell them things like, oh, well, the coatings are so much better on this brand of lens, your pictures will be so much sharper. No, coating has nothing to do with sharpness. Coating has to do with decreasing flare and ghosting. And to be honest, <laughs> they're all the same today. If you get the garbagey lenses, like some of the Chinese lenses that I, well, when I say Chinese lenses, the domestic Chinese production lenses, those manual focus things that aren't really automated with third-party names on them, they sometimes have poor coatings, and the contrast won't be quite as high. But you only see that if you shoot directly into the sun to be an idiot like I will do. So I, I would not wait at all, waste any time at all about coatings. Let me go back here. Looking at questions that came in about 58 minutes after the hour, and it's now three, so I'm about five minutes behind. Do I expect Nikon Z9 to be able to reshuffle the Canon Sony Nikon deck? Absolutely not. The Z9 doesn't even exist. They can't give us... This is hilarious. It looks like a bird. Now oh, the wind is back. <laughs> My kids are probably watching this and laughing their little patooties up. No, this, I, Nikon doesn't even have a Z9. If they had one, they'd actually know the specs and they'd tell us, but they don't have it, so they can't. In other words, they don't tell us the specs because they haven't come up with the specs yet because they don't have the thing designed yet. So whenever it hits, it'll hit. No, it's not going to change everything. And the defects in Nikon system, which is that a lot of it is offshore outside of Japan. Honestly, if I'm going to buy Nikon, I want quality. If I want quality, I want it made in Japan. Like anything I buy, I want it made in the country where it was designed and where, you know, the chief executives all live. That's where the engineers all live and work on it. That's where I want my stuff to cover them. 
Nikon has really dumped most of their production off to China and the third world, so I don't really get too excited about buying anything new from China. Anything new from Nikon. Canon, on the other hand, all this stuff comes from Japan. Even the lens hood. From my 14 to 35, even the lens hood is proudly made in Japan. You know what am I gonna do about this? Can I cheat? There, fixed. <laughs> so that's my opinion. Will it change everything? No, plus also the Z9 is gonna be a $6,000 camera, $6,500 camera, and therefore it's not gonna be what everybody buys. Honestly, I like the ZFC and the Z50. They're cute little cameras. They work incredibly well. Okay. Oh. Andrew asks, at 59 minutes past the hour, when should I consider upgrading my pair of D2X? Um, I would think you should have considered upgrading about 10 years ago. They're totally obsolete. And by totally obsolete, Nikon really is only two generations of digital cameras. The first generation from 1999 with the D1 through the second generation, which were everything that was introduced before the end of 2007. So the D2X was before that. The D3 and the D300 were the first cameras of Nikon's newest generation, which is exactly the same still through today. And the way you tell the difference is if you look at the picture controls that have the current levels of settings where saturation goes from minus three to plus three, those are all the modern cameras and they all look the same. Honestly, in good light, the results are indistinguishable. The D2X, just like the D1, has the older system and the pictures don't look anywhere near as good. They're, you got me. I've been going, talking all day long how the coatings don't make any difference. What does make a difference is the era of your digital camera. And the old D2X, the pictures just don't look good. Uh, the colors are bad. I've got a D2HS. I mean, it's fun, but it's totally obsolete. So I would turn that into the local police station or possibly if there's a surrender station at your local hospital or emergency room and, and get rid of that D2X and get anything else from Nikon or Canon and go on with that. So... Again, these are all my opinions. We all have our own opinions. Okay, as Top Yagal asks, 59 minutes past the hour, will there be third-party lenses for Nikon Z bodies from Sigma, Tamron, etc.? You know, it's funny. People always talk about Sigma and Tamron. The only one of the big three of the junk brands, well, I shouldn't say, Tokina, I don't consider a junk brand. Tokina is my favorite of those. Tokina is part of Hoya. Hoya is the world's largest manufacturer of optical glass who sells glass to all the other major brands, especially Leica. Those other brands don't tell you that because they don't want to admit to it. I remember back in the old days, Leica and Minolta would always talk about how they made their own glass and everything is so awesome. Well, they haven't told us that for a long time because now they just buy glass from whomever, be it shot in Germany or Hoya in Japan. But I've always had a soft spot for Tokina if I was buying a third party lens. Now, let's see. The thing is switching to Sony when the a7 IV comes out. My wisdom, I don't like Sony at all. Every time I shoot Sony, I hate it. Why? Well, the pictures don't look as good as Nikon or Canon because I don't like the colors as much, but that's very personal. But ergonomically, Sonys are awful. They're awful in two dimensions, awful. The first dimension is that just when you pick it up and hold it, this Canon feels good. Everything is, notice how the angle of this, notice my finger and notice the angle on my Canon R5. Notice how they're at the same angle. Sony, they let the VCR guys design their, ah, I got some more black in the image so my face is getting lighter. My face doesn't look like this. I'm only a foot away from my camera. So I look, my nose is too big, my ears disappeared. This is good. Sony's always have it at the wrong angle. Nikon is also really good at this so that the mirrorless aren't so awesome. All the buttons on the back, when I feel these around, you can't see it in this video but these are all at different levels above or below the deck. And so I can tell by feel what button I've got. Everything feels good and I love it. Sony's don't feel good. You'll notice there's no straight edges on this camera. Everything is a curve. Even this right here, this is radius. This is not a sharp edge. So the Sony's might look good like on a counter if you're at your friend's house and he's showing you a Sony, if you're not actually shooting it, but once you shoot it for more than about 20 minutes, you're Everything starts to hurt because there's so many hard edges, especially the hard edge back here on Sony's. I do not like shooting with Sony. And the other part is the menu systems are atrocious, which is another word for awful on Sony's. Everything is really confused on Sony. So I do not like shooting Sony. No, I do not, um, no matter what they are. They're getting better. I really respect Sony. They are the world's leading manufacturer of electronic image sensors and have been for decades. I worked with Sony or for Sony back 30 years ago uh, as a manufacturer's representative and uh, applications engineer for their entire line of CCDs, which was well what the image sensors were called back then. 
And even back then they made full frame sensors. Yes, they know what they're doing when it comes to make Im making image sensors. In fact, their image sensors in just about everybody's cameras, except for Canon who makes their own. But I believe, you know, lots of the iPhones, lots of the Nikons, nobody ever comes up on the record and says this, but uh, are using Sony sensors. But the magic is not the sensor. The magic is in how you interface the sensor. I used to help people with that. How do you design getting the, people don't realize there's no such thing as a digital sensor. The sensor in your digital camera is entirely analog and you collect photons and all those little wells and you read those little photons off as minute, minute, sub-microscopic electrical charges. And if you don't do it just right, you're not gonna get what you want. You're gonna get noise, you're gonna get interference from the digital circuits, and it's really nasty. But also, what's important is the magic sauce or secret sauce that every manufacturer uses to create colors and light and tone from what comes out raw off the sensor, what comes out. Fred Ron worked at a, a spring water factory and he says what people didn't realize is the stuff that they got out of their wells from the spring below was basically mud. And it was not coming off a mountain stream like with a cup, it was mud. And what the company did is of course refine that mud water into the spring water they sold, but he pointed out they actually could have made a better product if they just got water from the tap and started with cleaner water to begin with. So likewise, it comes off your raw sensors, just raw mud, and it doesn't have the magic into it until whatever brand of camera you prefer. I prefer Nikon and Canon. Sony is kind of a second place choice for me, and Fuji's downright awful. So just, to me, Fuji doesn't look good for anything but people pictures. But that's just me, this is all art, and it's all a question of how you want it to look. But by all means, as time goes on, the world has gone mirrorless, the, those mounts are popular, and all the third-party guys will definitely be introducing lenses native to those mounts. It's just what they do, and always have done. I remember things like the Tamron Adaptal mount in the 1970s where they sold a lens you'd buy, and you'd buy this little adapter ring to adapt it to your brand of camera. And they're really kludgy because every camera, uh, different cameras would go different directions, right or left for the aperture ring. <laughs> and these adapters had to contort that around depending on which brand it was. So it's just a matter of time. But here's the other thing. If you buy a, a single lens reflex lens, like a Canon lens, a Canon EOS mount lens, you can then adapt that to the Canon RF cameras and that mount from Canon, that adapter, the EF to RF adapter mount. In fact, I've got them here. I brought my camera bag out, so I had some goodies to show you. Let's see, where is that? I think that's on, no? Is it over? Oh, it's on this body. No, that's my 180. Hey, I'm gonna stand up, hold on. Oh, here it is. Yeah, this little adapter ring I think you guys all know, this is old hat. This EOS to RF adapter ring works flawlessly. Everything Canon has ever made since 1987 works perfectly on my R5. It's not like Nikon's FTZ where nothing works perfectly, if at all. Uh, you also can get third-party adapters, and I don't ever recommend these. Like, I have reviews of things like the Fringer EOS to Z adapter, so I can use these Canon lenses on my Nikon Z which is kind of funny because all the Canon lenses work on that adapter with Nikon Z, but if you use Nikon Z adapter, FTZ, only some of the lenses Nikon has made will actually autofocus. A lot of the autofocus lenses Nikon made won't autofocus on mirrorless, so who cares? But you can do that. So I hope I've answered that. Okay, I'm going back to my comments. You guys are a little bit ahead of me here. Well, you're always gonna be a little ahead of me because I can't answer questions before they come in. Okay. Okay, got that. Okay, now a question came in 59 past the hour. Wait till Apple puts an APS-C sensor. You know, I don't care. Apple is beyond just the specs. I love my Apple stuff. Why? Because it works great. More people take pictures on an iPhone every day than any other camera. So it doesn't matter what size the sensor is. What matters is the genius that goes in the firmware and the software that runs inside their cameras to make it look awesome. Favorite photo I've taken? My favorite photos are the ones on my homepage at kenrockwell.com. And what's curious to me is, is the top photo you can follow along in here at home. It's like the, the underside of a pier, which is like a pier and then all these things going off like this on the top. I took that with my iPhone using the ultra wide 13 millimeter equivalent lens. And it was under a bridge in Cayucas, California in June. And it was totally dark under there. We couldn't see a thing. And the iPhone pulled out all this color from under the bridge. Now, of course I tweaked a little bit after an editing, but still the iPhone got it and it looks awesome. But then the second picture on that homepage of kenrockwell.com is a shot I took in a stairwell of a cheap motel. Well, actually it was a cheap motel, but the best motel in town in Barstow, California, along Route 66. And I shot that on a Hasselblad with a super wide C Hasselblad on Fuji Velvia, and that looks good. 
Need some light on my face. Yes, we do, but I figured, hey, it's a free video. This is informal. So I didn't feel like putting a whole bunch of light on my face. And I do have some videos that I've shot live here where I showed you some kinds of lighting. But what I realized was I nearly went blind because to get my face to look good, it needs to be brighter than the surrounding light. The surrounding light should actually be a little dimmer so I would stand out. And by the time I shoot that much light in my face to compete with daylight, compete with daylight, it was not pleasant for me. And since I'm not getting paid to be here, screw it. Uh, you know, I'm not talent. I'm not a model. I don't have to put up with that stuff. And so that's why there's less light in my face. You know, if I wanted to spend three hours setting this up, honestly, it's Saturday afternoon. I'm off. I'd rather be goofing off, reading the book or listening to music. So <laughs> that's what you get for what you pay here. I'm bad. I'm bad. Okay. Greetings from Miami, Florida at one minute past the hour. Hello, Miami. Miami's awesome. What's my opinion of the upcoming Z9? Uh, my folks told me it wasn't nice to tease. Nikon has told us absolutely nothing about the Z9 except one picture of some big ugly thing. No specs, no price, no delivery. So my opinion is I just don't care and I wish they'd stop bugging me about it until I can actually order and shoot it. Will I buy the Canon R3? Well, I already have one on order. Uh, I think it's gonna be awesome. Will I keep it? You know, I buy a lot of stuff, but I also return a lot of stuff. A Z9 looks nice. I don't know anything about the Z9 unless something came out I didn't know. They haven't told us what it is or what it does, so I don't care. You see, consumers will get all excited. Hobbyists will get excited about things that don't exist. Like, oh, the Z9, oh. Because Nikon does that. They spend money to try to mess with your mind and get you thinking about it and get me talking about it because you guys are talking about it. It doesn't exist, it doesn't matter. Nikon Z9 is a non-issue because I can't take pictures with it. And if I can't take pictures with it, it serves no purpose. Okay. Let's see, I'm going back here, looking at your questions. Oh, I'm sorry, and if any of you have just joined us, I'm Ken Rockwell with KenRockwell.com, coming to you live here on KenRockwell.tv. It's now, uh, serious. it's 16 minutes past the hour, regardless of where you are in the world, unless you're one of those unusual places with, uh, I think, India, <laughs> some parts of the Middle East that have 30 minutes off, but it's uh, 16 minutes past the hour, and I'm answering any and all questions that you can just put in the comments section, wherever that is on your, your browser here, in your comments section, and then, I will answer them live because I can see your comments here on my screen. And I better speed it up a little bit because uh, you guys are getting a little bit ahead of me, but that's good because it makes up for it lost. Okay, Donald Hawk says, he wrote it three minutes past the hour. Based on his budget, he's debating GFX 50S and kit, Canon R5 and kit. What is opinion on media format? You know, it all comes down to how do the pictures look? And I don't like the way the Fuji pictures look. Sure, on my website, if you look at my GFX 50, review. I can make great pictures with it, but I have to tweak the colors a lot. And for some reason, I always wind up taking them on, on nature landscape things like out to Yosemite. And of course, I get good pictures because I'm an artist and artists will get the same pictures regardless of the camera that he uses. Why? Because the nature of how you make art in photography is you have an idea in your head and you keep working on your piece until your piece matches your vision and then you're done. And Canon, I so much prefer Canon for people or for everything. I would not buy Fuji because the GFX cameras, they impress the innocent because they're big and they're ugly. The pictures look awful because they're really dull in terms of color. And the ergonomics are absolutely atrocious again. So I would not ever buy a GFX camera. Um, but that's just me. The people who have them love them. And the people who, I complain about soft colors, the people that love these cameras say they love the color rendition. It's all like, you know, any kind of film or whatnot, brands of film. Okay, Gadev123 at three minutes past the hour says, I rave about the 20 f 1.8G for DSLR. No, ah, do I recommend the 20 millimeter f 2.8 AFD? Now those are Nikon letters. No, I do not recommend the 20 millimeter f 2.8 AFD for anything except use on, you know, I actually don't recommend it for anything anymore. It was uh, the first autofocus lens they made at 20 millimeters. They made that, came out in about 86 with their first line of autofocus lenses. It will not autofocus on an adapter on your mirrorless cameras. So it's kind of a dinosaur. Optically, it was the same or is the same as the manual focus 20 millimeter f 2.8 AIS lens, which came out in the 1970s, which works great when stopped down, but it's really soft in the corners if you shoot it at 2.8. So today, get the 22.8 G if you want performance. Otherwise, I love my 21, excuse me, get the 20 millimeter f 1.8 G for Nikon. It is optically superior. Even though the 20 millimeter f 2.8 AFD is mechanically superior, I don't think it matters. The best mechanical lens is the 20 millimeter of 2.8 AIS lenses, all the AIS lenses from mine. So yeah, get the G lens for the Nikon. John H says, wow, I'm a book of knowledge. Outstanding, thank you. Four minutes past the hour. Okay, why not have a light to light up your face? This is not very professional. You know why? Because 
I don't like having bright lights shining in my face, says uh, V. Wo at the seven minutes past the hour. Again, I'm not, trying to, I'm not a professional videographer. I'm a photographic artist. I'm not a video guy. I'm not a YouTube guy. I'm doing this for fun. So <laughs> you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. Dennis Beaton says at nine minutes past the hour, am I looking, for my Yosemite, looking forward to my Yosemite workshop next week? I am so looking forward to that. Uh, the first photo trip I did in about two years was in June when we went to the Central Coast of California, and that was awesome. And I'm so looking forward to getting out of jail. Well, I guess we've been out of jail. I mean, I got all my vaccines back in like January and February, so I've been out of jail since then. But I am certainly looking forward to getting up to Yosemite and seeing some fall color, just to say it could be an up there, much less taking pictures. Sean Warner, at 10 minutes past the hour, asks, what's my opinion of Viltrox? Some of their primes for the Z system are getting awfully good reviews. You know, as a traditional old-timer, I don't believe in any of this third-party stuff. I only shoot camera band lenses on their brand of camera. Viltrox is just a junky brand, and I see it's pushed by Amazon, which is really sad. Amazon used to have the customer's best interest in hand. Now when I go to Amazon and search for stuff, I see all these junk brands. And sometimes when I've done things, I like bought the card reader that Amazon recommends, like a QXD card reader. It didn't work. It was junk. I threw it away. As opposed to when I go to B&H and use their search tool, they're, as well as Adorama, they're much better curated or much more better much, whatever, they're better curated. They don't have the rubbish there, and if they do have rubbish, they don't present it. So, no, I have never tried one of the Viltrox lenses, unless maybe I have, check my website. But any of this third-party stuff, I never like. It's for people, I remember when I first started, and I used to go and buy off-party lenses, and I realized then, that, or I realized later, as people tell me, the poor man always pays twice. So we go off and buy a junk brand, great. And guess what, we still always want the camera brand lens, we always eventually buy the camera brand lens, and there we go. So honestly, I'm speaking from no experience here with Viltrox. I see them out there, some Maeda stuff I see. Amazon tries to push. He's looking for legitimate lens, like 35 millimeter F2s. They're kind of counterfeits of the Canon autofocus lenses or not. So I don't know. I wouldn't spend my money on it. Or if I did, the reason I've always bought from Adorama and B&H since the 1970s is because I used to get like a week to return policy. Now we have like 30 day return policy. So if you're ever in question, who cares what I think or whatever anybody else thinks? Order it from any of the links that I have on my website, or I guess I'll put them in the comments of this, uh, this video after the fact, but now go to kenrockwell.com, click links. And those are the guys I've used since the 70s. They all have great return policies. So if you think you're gonna like it, get it. If you hate it, send it back. But rarely is there anything really awful today. Things are much better today than they used to be. Let's see, Angel of Fanatic, Angel of Fanatic, Angel of Fanatic, Angel of Fanatic. You know, I can't read these things. 11 minutes past the hour, 100% agree. Fresh from Nikon Z to Sony's A7S III for video. And the sensor and specs are great, but the menu, the ergonomics, the 1.8 lenses, it all feels cheap compared to Nikon and Canon. Well, it does. You know, I'm just not a fan of Sony. Huge fan and huge respect for Sony and video. When I worked in Hollywood, in radio, TV, actually in Hollywood, I was working in motion pictures and, and, and network television. And the network television was kind of like, you know, way step down from the motion picture work in Hollywood. Sony is huge. We used to do everything on their $30,000 CRT monitors, the BVM 30 whatever HD monitors. We looked at those things all day long. Sony D1, D2 recorders was it recorded everything back about the year 2000. So Sony knows professional video. They invented half of this. Same thing for professional, audio, professional digital audio. Sony was huge in that. For cameras, I'm not sold on them yet. And honestly, if I wanted to shoot video, I'd use my iPhone like I'm doing here, and I'd throw some lights on my face, or... I get a legitimate video camera. Okay, Ali Avskis, it says 11 minutes past the hour. Says Sony looks like HDR is a Nikon shooter. He notices this every time. Yeah, as I say, every camera brand has its own look. And so you need to shoot the brand that gives you your look. So we're all different. Ah, John H is signing off. He says, help me to keep, he, he says, can keep up the great work for you do for us. He appreciates my sound advice. Stay safe, all peace and love. John, you're awesome. Thank you so much for visiting. Oh, cool. E. E. Eros is writing from Helsinki, Finland at 13 minutes past the hour. Probably dark up there. And I've never been to Finland. I can't wait to go, though. Ali asks at 14 minutes past the hour, which popular AFS lenses aren't focused on the FTZ? Ah, I like the way the question's answered. All of the AFS lenses, that's uh, AFS for silent wave motor, they do autofocus on the FTZ. However, none of the A original AF from the 1980s or AFD lenses, which were started in, the started in 1993, and are still made and sold today, the AFD lenses will not autofocus No Way Jose on an FTZ. And some of the greatest Nikon lenses, like the 100mm F2 DC, defocus control, which is bokeh control, or the 135 F2 DC, 
bokeh control, defocus control lens, one of the greatest lenses ever for portraiture, is totally a manual focus dud on the FTZ. So Nikon pretty much, I can't say shat on the air here, but, but pooped on their heritage when they got cheap with the FTZ and deliberately chose not to include an autofocus motor, which is sneaky because by doing that, people buy it thinking, oh great, I can use my old lenses. And then they put on one of the AFD lenses saying, oh, well, I just have to focus it manually. It's not that big a deal. But Nikon knows, because they've been doing this for over 100 years, that people won't be completely happy with it. So they're eventually going to go out and buy the native Z lens anyway. So the poor man paid twice. But even sneakier, they got you to buy into Nikon instead of doing what you should do. When you go to mirrorless, it's a brave new world. And you need to ask yourself, what brand is best? I like Canon. Um, you know, Nikon's a second choice and everybody else I, I would never buy. But don't get tricked into thinking, oh, I have all these Nikon lenses, they'll work just fine on the FTZ. Make sure you try them out. If they're manual focus AI, AI or AIS lens, they don't work right because the aperture ring doesn't couple. And if it's an AF or AFD lens, it won't even autofocus. So it will not be fun. You can make it work and you can make it work for about 45 days. And so unless you bought from Crutchfield, which offers a 60 day return policy, you're gonna be like, you know, this stinks and my return policy expires and I'm stuck with this stupid Nikon system. I'm looking here. Again, I'm answering all your questions. If you put them in the comments section, I can see them up here on my screen. They appear over here on my screen, which I don't think you see that part. And you guys are getting a little ahead of me. Again, this is Ken Rockwell live here. I'm answering your questions live on the air. Just put your questions in the comments section. And we'll keep doing this for as long as I feel like until I have to go to the bathroom. I've done these before and I go for about three hours that I'm like, my, my voice is hoarse. Okay, at 15 minutes past the hour, Larry Salderman says, what about Canon pre-1987 lenses? All Nikon lenses fit on the FTZ, though very low to high compatibility, but will fit. You know, Canon did the right thing. In 1987, they ticked off every one of their customers by completely obsoleting their entire line of FT, uh, blah, blah, FD lenses. And there are still some old folks who are still ticked off about that with Canon. What Canon did was, is the FD lens was a, just a collage of just a mess of stuff there are various, you know, incremental mechanical improvements over the years. Canon did the right thing, and they created the EOS mount, which was the world's first electronic, fully electronic mount. This is a traditional EOS mount. Can I get this to focus? You see these electrical connectors? Everything talks to the lens, to the camera electronically, including autofocus, including the diaphragm stopping down, and it took all the other makers 30 years to try to catch up. Nikon isn't caught up. The Nikon E lenses that have an electronic diaphragm have barely caught up like 30 plus years later. Uh, all the Fuji lenses are electronic and all the mirrorless lenses today finally caught up. But that's why Nikon has such problems with compatibility because their autofocus lenses are a mishmash because back in 1987 or 1986 in Nikon's case, the pros shot Nikon, they didn't shoot Canon. So Canon could get away with telling everybody, screw you guys, we're gonna come up with a totally incompatible system. And a lot of people were ticked off, but the pros weren't ticked off because the pros didn't shoot Canon. They shot Nikon exclusively. Nikon killed themselves by being such a leader because all the guys that bought thousands and tens of thousands of dollars worth of lenses, 300, 2.8s and so forth, manual focus, they wanted to make sure they could use those on the autofocus cameras that Nikon introduced. Nikon couldn't get away with saying, screw you guys, your $10,000 investment in lenses, we just totally obsolete and trashed. So the problem is for Nikon 30 years later, they're still carrying all this baggage. And that's why their adapter doesn't work properly. So sorry about that. I'm trying to go back here. Okay, that's it. So if you want to use FD lenses, guess what? You can get an FD adapter. Oh, here's the thing. Larry's pointing out he's thinking Nikon's better because, oh my gosh, all the old Nikon lenses work on the FTZ. Well, guess what? If you want to shoot an old Nikon lens from 1959 or even my rangefinder lenses from the 1940s, I don't need the FTZ because the FTZ has no electronic communication. I can go out and buy a $15 adapter from China that works just great with the old lenses on Nikon. But guess what? Those lenses from Ch those adapters from China for 15 bucks, I can order them just as well for $15 to work on the Canon system. And then I can use those same Nikon lenses on the Canon system with just as much functionality as they will have on Nikon's useless system uh, with the old manual focus lenses. Enrique Buccios at 60 minutes as the hour says, Canon 1DX Mark I, secondhand worth it? Would be, look at my review. I think I reviewed the 1DX Mark I. And honestly, I haven't tracked prices, but that's a top level pro camera. Something consumers tend not to appreciate is when you get a top, if you go to a top level pro camera like the original 1DX and shoot it, it is so fast in ways that you can't imagine coming from a consumer camera. The autofocus systems are built to be able to track things at you know 12 frames a second or whatever those run at. And the build quality is superb. So by all means, you, know, you have to answer your own question as to what is it worth to you. 
But yeah, buying top level pro stuff, I mean, heck, I own Mercedes. Everyone I own is, is used, but it was always the top V8, you know, top end model at the time. And I much prefer that to a newer, crappier one. That's just newer. Skidoo 22 asked, eight minutes, 60 minutes past the hour. Been shooting a super ag, Agfa Super Isolet all day. Great review of my site. Thanks, he says. Thank you. What secondhand digital camera would I recommend now and what lens? I don't recommend secondhand digital cameras. Why? Simple. Film cameras, they've been around a while. Digital cameras get so much better every year, every year and a half, that to buy a used one, I just don't see the point. And admittedly, if you want to buy one, well, there's tons of them out there. Any Nikon introduced, uh, with any Nikon whose model originally was introduced from the D700, D300, D3, all look good. Likewise, the cannons look good too, but no opinion on that, please, of what used digital camera to buy. Trying to look through my comments. Going to get all your comments here. It's Ken Rockwell, live here at KenRockwell.com and it's KenRockwell.tv. And I'm answering your questions that you can post in the comment section, and I can see them here on my screen. Hey, Eros likes his D800, another excellent camera. Sam Rubenstein, excuse me, Rubenstein, asked at 17 minutes past the average. I think the Z6 used for about $1,000 is a good starting point for full frame. No, I think it's a horrible starting point for full frame. And the reason for that is it's Nikon. I would not lead with Nikon. In other words, I would not throw any more money at Nikon because I think Nikon is going away. Nikon is spending less money on a corporate level on developing their cameras because they have lower sales than Canon. And I don't, they haven't kept up now and I don't think they can keep up. And so I would not throw any more money into Nikon. Yeah, like most old guys, I've been shooting Nikon since they were good. Nikon was the leader in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and part of the 90s. And those of us who can remember those days, remember that Nikon was a pro camera. Not today, not the chat crappy Chinese and Thailand-made plastic garbage they sell. No way, Jose. You can pay $2,600 for the 70-200Z lens, offshored, out, to, out of the country. So, not that I don't love Thailand, and that's what I had for lunch today, but I'm not going to give Nikon $2,600 for their crappy lens for it. Yeah, Ali admits he agrees with me. If I can't shoot with it, it doesn't count. Jave, X-A-V-E, as 17 after the hour. Canon macro lenses, EF100 or RF100? You know, they're all going to be equally sharp. Here we go. I've got both right here because I've been working on them. Here's the RF100. And here, let me find it. I have, this is their first 100 millimeter of 2.8 macro lens ever. This is the EF macro lens. I think I paid about $200 for this used on eBay just a couple of months ago just so I could formally review it. The reviews are all up at KenRockwell.com. Optically, this is just as good. Put it in manual focus here. Hold on. Oh, that's the focus limiter. This is a great lens. It's made out of all metal. It focuses all the way to one-to-one. -one. It focuses very quickly. It works flawlessly in all the Canon mirrorless cameras with a, an EF to RF adapter. What it doesn't do is it doesn't have vibration reduction, although it'll work with the built-in reduction on some of the cameras. And it doesn't have instant auto manual focus override. You can't just grab the ring for it to do it. So if you're a cheapskate for mirror, get the, actually, if you're a cheapskate, get the USM version, which I don't have here in my bag. Because the USM version, you just grab the ring at any time for auto manual focus adjustments. But if you have an RF camera, you might as well just get the RF 100 because it's going to be, it is an awesome, awesome lens. I do for comparison, I compare all of the Canon 100 millimeter lenses. They make four different macros at 100 millimeters and one fixed 100 millimeter of two for the EF system. Go to KenRockwell.com and just search for Canon 100 millimeter compared and you can see my thoughts. So it really depends on how cheap you want to be. And again, I'm looking at your comments here live. Ken Rockwell with KenRockwell.com here on KenRockwell.tv. Again, put your questions in the comments and I can answer them live. Hey, Satid Panich says at 18 minutes past the hour, he's watching from Thailand. He just woke up too early to do morning run. Hey, so tell me, tell you if my comments on Thailand are good. I mean, Thailand is an awesome place, but I reviewed it. You know, it's not Japan. Thailand is fun. I love the Thai food, but I'm thinking if I'm paying top dollar for an icon lens, I'd really rather pay for one made in Japan. Maybe it's just me. You know, my Mercedes are made in Germany. My Leicas are made in Germany. I want stuff made where it's supposed to be. Well, stuff made in the country where it was designed, not stuff that's simply shipped overseas for less expensive labor. Okay, my human record wreckage, Andrew asks, at 18 minutes past the hour. If I could be anywhere in the world besides California, where would it be? Probably France, because I love the food and I love the language and I love, I love all the art over there. They respect their artists. 
Or, you know, New Mexico's good too. It's all good. The whole world's good. Thailand's fun. I have never been there, but it's all about partying, I think. But I don't know. Frank asks, 20 minutes past the hour, have I spent any time with the Canon M6 Mark II? No, I'm sorry. It turns out with all the things that keep coming out from Japan, I barely can keep up with what I've kept up with. And for some reason, my coverage is very shoddy. Not, no, not shoddy. It's not defective. It's just very, very light on the M6 II. You know, I'm just thinking my iPhone, my crazy hair day here, I can't see what my 16 by 9 is. And I don't have an iPad out here to see what my live YouTube stream is going on. I'm trying to truncate, crop off the top of my head so that crazy hair day doesn't offend you folks with your uh, great hair styles. Okay, Mindo says, at 20 minutes past the hour, he asks, he says, hey dude, you're pretty much responsible for his entire photographic career and gear obsession. All the best from Scotland. Ah, oh, love Scotland. My great, 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 great grandfather came from air. Well, thank you very much for that comment. I appreciate that. 21 past the hour, Solare Music asks, Ken, what do I think Leica will come up with next in terms of rangefinders? Another question, well, there's rangefinders? I don't know, Leica's shtick is introduced in the same old camera from 1953, which is the M3, and ever since the M3 came out, they've simply made it cheaper to try to sell more of them, but guess what? Leica should know this, people don't want to buy cheap. The M3 is still the greatest Leica ever, made from 1953 to the 1960s. Everything else is a step down. And they talk about MP, mechanical perfection. No, they're lying. They're just trying to take rich guys' money. Best camera ever was a Leica M3. Find a good service guy you can keep it maintained for you. It's got the best rangefinder system, and it's so good that it costs Leica so much to make is why they haven't ever come up with an 0.91 magnification rangefinder, viewfinder yet, to the M3. And Leica will always be coming up with special editions and other, you know, redoing the same 1950s camera design that went obsolete in the 1960s when Nikon SLRs became popular for 35 millimeter. But again, Leica is more of a lifestyle decision than a, a photographic tool. Another question, do I ever use the Olympus Pen F? Never use the Olympic, Olympus Pen F. Great content on my site. Thank you very much, Solari Music. Clive Mitchison asked at 21 minutes past the hour, do I ever use any film? No, really I haven't. Film is such a pain, trying to drive it back and forth to the lab, and admit the last film I shot on my Hasselblad in Yosemite, I haven't even done anything with yet, so I'm kind of reticent to remiss. I don't even know what these words mean. They just sound good. Uh, to shoot more, more film, to just put in more binders that I'll probably never get around to publishing. Also today, I only shoot film for black and white. For color film, I much prefer the colors I get on digital because by the time I scan Novia, it looks pretty crummy compared to what I get on digital. And the only really good application of Velvia film today is if you're looking at it directly on a light box, like big 4x5 or 8x10 transparencies, those are amazing. Or if I'm going to project it, put my slides in a projector, my two and a quarter slides or my 35 millimeter slides, project it in a totally dark room on a real screen. Not on a bed sheet in a bedroom at night, but a totally dark room on a real screen. And that is also amazing. And most people today haven't seen it because you'll get colors you can't get on digital because there's a larger color palette on Velvia when you transmit it, transmit it project it directly from the film. Michael, yeah, Michael Hershkovitz asks at 22 minutes past the hour, he, loved my, he loves my reviews. If I could be CEO of one of the camera companies, which one? I wouldn't want to be CEO of any of the camera companies because being CEO is a lot of work. I just want to be in charge of my own little company here. I, I love Canon the best. It seems like they have the best corporate culture. It seems like they care about the customer the most and that's important to me. Sony just is technical. Nikon seems to look at our we the customers as, you know, in positions in their the otherwise busy day, uh, at least here in the United States. Fuji might be a good company. They make film. They make all kinds of crazy stuff. Paul asks, re review the new Pentax camera. No, I'm not going to review Pentax. Pretty much has been behind since the '80s. Uh, Fuji T100V. Yes or no? Good or great? Uh, I think Gary Cully asked at 24 minutes past the hour. The X100V. It's good. It's a very specialized camera. Any of the X100 series are very similar. And honestly, I think I, I just stopped, I kept up with the X100F. I didn't see the point of getting the V because it took, removed some of the controls I use and replaced them with touch functions, which are awful. So all that information is up at kenrockwell.com. Just look at my Fuji X100V articles and my comparison articles and you can get all my opinions. Phantomic Films right is 25 minutes past the hour. He got an FM3A also due to my blog. Thank you very much. Burley Sajinsky says at 25 minutes past the hour, he wants my opinion. Is there any need for a high-res mode, especially on Fuji GFX100? No. If by high-res mode you mean the, the scanning modes where they move the sensor half a pixel 
to get full RGB pixels for each of the pixels. Those, all of those methods are useless for taking actual photographs. The only thing they're good for is if you're working in a laboratory where everything's locked down on granite rate tables and so forth, and you're photographing something that doesn't move and isn't alive. And guess what? If you're doing that, just using a regular flatbed scanner works, be works better. The reason that those scanning modes, they call high-res modes, they're really scanning modes, are useless in the real world is, well, unless you have a tripod, which is made of like 6,000 pounds of granite, just the vibrations in the air enough to move the camera enough that you pretty much defeat the purpose of these fractional pixels. Plus, in the reality, just a tree growing and so forth. I've tried these things. They don't work. So try it yourself, but I wouldn't mess with those modes because at least I have never had good results with it. So that's my opinion to answer your question. And I'm looking at your questions here. Again, this is Ken Rockwell. I'm live here. And I'm going to answer all of your questions. All you need to do is put them in the comment section. And I will call it up here in the order in which they were received. Hip Hop for Kids at 25S the Hour says, What's my opinion of the YouTube camera viewer? And is there one I actually trust? Honestly, I don't watch YouTube. My kids watch YouTube. If I want real information, I'll go ask someone who knows. Uh, that's actually that's a really important question. When you, I've had this on my website called, uh, I think it's called my About Other Reviews page. When you're looking at someone else's opinions on cameras, first and foremost, before you take any advice at all from a stranger, or even someone you think is your friend on YouTube, look at their gallery, look at their portfolio, look at the work that they have created, look at their photographs. Now, there's a lot of guys with billions of followers on YouTube who have no body of work. They're not photographers. They're people who came from other walks of life and just happens to do really good work at YouTube. Not like this work with me in like dark shadow, but these guys have multiple people working for them to do the lighting and editing and so forth. But ultimately the quality of information is you need to look at the images that they've created. And would you aspire to create images like that? Or is it really just pictures of their backyard? Like somebody's backyard here. And so I wouldn't take anybody's advice because what happens is the guy that works, or woman who works full time as a pro, doesn't have time for YouTube nonsense. Doesn't have time to do a website. They're off shooting and working really hard to make ends meet while they're shooting. But that's the person you want the information from. In other words, the person who talks the least is the person from whom you want most to give you advice. In other words, if you admire their, their work, like Annie Leibovitz, her work's brilliant. You know, try to get her advice. But does she have a website or YouTube channel telling you how she did stuff? I don't know, I don't think I've seen one. They're the one you want to go. You don't want it like these guys who used to work for National Geographic now spend all the time doing web, webinars and stuff. Maybe those guys are good because they actually, that's is it. They have had a good body of work. And so they, those would be good guys to do. But those are not the guys with trillions of viewers on YouTube. The guys with trillions of viewers of YouTube are YouTubers. So no, I don't think I take anybody's advice. And also, I trust my own advice best. I've always bought my stuff since the 70s out in New York where I had a return policy. I buy it, I try it. If I love it, I keep it. If I don't love it, back it goes. And that's what I advise with people. Try it yourself. There's really no way to try something. Reviews are useless because we're all different. We all want something different. The key is to try it in your own hands for your own subjects in your own country, doing what you want to do in your own system. That's what matters. Okay, Sam asks, he's, I've never reviewed a Panasonic camera. You know, you can search. I think I have reviewed some Panasonic cameras, but I just haven't had the time. Panasonic hasn't never been a pro brand, and so it just hasn't really gotten on my radar. Would I recommend the Z50 for sports? Timothy Brown asks, absolutely not, because the Z50 can't autofocus fast. It's for stills and travel. It's great, not for sports. If you're getting a Z50, get the two kit lenses, the 16 to 50 and the 50 to 250 but neither of those focus ultra fast. So no, skip that for sports. Get a digital less single lens reflex. Even like a D3500 probably focuses faster than a Z50. Oh, Stephen Haley asks, should he trade in a Z50 for the ZFC? He has a 26 minutes past the hour. No, uh, they're the same camera. It's just a matter of would you like silver or would you like black? And would you like the controls and the style of the ZFC or the Z50? It's really a personal preference. So if you own the one, it's probably not worth it to trade for the other. Again, Ken Rockwell here live, kenrockwell.com, I'm kenrockwell.tv. Asking any questions and answering any questions you want, just put them down in the comment section. Brad asks, 27 minutes past the hour, primary camera is D4, great camera. He gave a 24 shift, tilt shift that wants another for artistic street architecture, not PC. You know? Oh, you have, okay. What I, you know? Okay. Artistic street architecture, not PC. I'm not sure of your question, Brad. I'm not, you say you don't want a tilt shift lens, not PC. Perspective control, 24 85, a 45 or 85. You know, 
with a 45 lens, it's all you would need. I just carry the 45. If you're gonna carry the 24 with you and you want a second lens, I would add the 85 instead of the 45, if that was your question. I find 24 and 85 covers everything. 45 and 24, not so much. Annie Rudolph, Annie, thank you so much. At 27 minutes past the hour, Annie says she's been following my reviews since 2009. Wow, definitely. Ah, send me an email and say hi, this is awesome. All these people have been reading my stuff, millions of people for all these years, and I never get to say hi to people. I love that. Thank you very much, Annie. Marcel says, why do I say 20 megapixel for the R6 is good enough? Because most of your photos get on Facebook anyway. For Facebook, you don't buy. What about cropping? Okay, this is an old question. From decades ago, I have articles called the megapixel myth. Marcel asked at 8, 28 minutes past the hour. People get excited. People fear uncertainty and doubt. Camera maker, all business people love this trick. They try to put some fear, uncertainty, or doubt in your mind so you think you really need 50 megapixels versus 20 because 20 sounds like, oh, the picture's gonna be fuzzy. No. Did you know that even if you're looking on a 4K screen, which you're not, if you're looking on an iPhone, it's got, uh, I forget how many pixels it has, it doesn't, it's not even 4K. A 4K screen only has eight megapixels. There's no way you're gonna ever use all of your 20 megapixels, much less 40. So yes, if you're gonna crop, camera makers don't want you to do that because they realize if you've got 50 megapixels, you can go out with your 24 millimeter lens and crop it to 300 millimeters and you still have enough pixels left over so you don't need to buy all the lenses. So no, you don't need to. You don't need pixels. It's nice to have, but if it matters money-wise, don't worry about it. John Bertoli says, fellow SD and from Oceanside, appreciates my work. Thank you, John. I appreciate you guys reading it and wasting your Saturday afternoon watching me blabble along here. Which like would I buy if I, if I buy one? Honestly, the best Leica ever is the Leica M3 35 millimeter camera from the 1950s. It's actually something really special. And if you're gonna get it, do not waste your time with garbage lenses from Voigtland or whatnot. Make sure to use Leica's lenses only. With the 35 millimeter, get the one with the goggles on it because the goggle lenses optimizes the viewfinder system of the M3 to cover 35 millimeters. Likewise, if you get a 135 millimeter lens, get the one with the goggles because it optimizes the viewfinder and it actually zooms in the viewfinder. So get the M3. They're digital cameras, I wouldn't get any of them. I mean, I bought them, but they're, they're awful. Giuseppe Mata from Sicily. Hi, hey, I had a gym teacher back when I went to elementary school and he was there for decades named Mr. Mata. So hello from Sicily. Oh, I love Italy. Hope to see me in Italy. Me too. <laughs> Follow me since D40. Everybody loves Italy. Everybody loves Italy. I remember I was in Torino helping them with a photo thing back in 2003. Basam asked me to review the Sigma FPL. I don't even know what that is. And honestly, with all of the new stuff coming out, it's tough to get to all the off-brands. Do I ever use my 50 millimeter F1.0 L Canon lens? Honestly, honestly, I really only use it for taking pictures of it on the cameras just because I have one. Uh, I really use my Canon 50 millimeter F1.8 if I want to shoot 50 millimeters. And honestly, I don't even use that. I use a Canon zoom. My favorite Canon zoom now is a 24 to 240. I use with my RF cameras. Analog designer J. Wow, analog designer. I used to design things like uh, multi-band analog signal processors back when I was in high school. That kind of analog you're talking about. 33 past the hour, he says he bought a used Canon EF 24-72.8 L2. Excellent, as I stated. Yes, it is. Those lenses are awesome. And they work great on the mirrorless cameras too. Ethan Ewell says at 234, have I ever had the first zoom lens ever made? A Voigt lens zoom made in the early 60s. It was a 2.8. No, I have not had that one. Sorry. Scott Lee. 34 minutes past the hour. Says he ordered a Canon RF teleconverter and received a crappy white plastic one made in Taiwan. Uh, I don't know. Let's see, RF teleconverter? I have reviews of the RF teleconverters. And if you go to my website, kenrockwell.com, you can take a look and I always report exactly where things are made. Annie, you're in Paris. Oh, I love France. I love France. I haven't been there since 97, but I speak a bit of French, and of course, when I was there, it kicked in, and I spoke nothing but French for about three weeks. It was my best trip ever. Thank you so much. Merci bien. Lion McLion hits his nice backyard. Well, I'm sure the owner will thank you. Harvey Yurogov at 36 after the hour says, Nikon just started to ship the new Z 40 millimeter of 2.8. Oh, that's good. Although immediately I'm thinking, oh, I'm so excited, a 40 millimeter 2.8. Like, what is this, 1940s, 35 millimeter rangefinder days? I can comment. He likes the camera, the M3. He says, I have fabulous content. Thank you so much. Christopher Sinkinger, at 30 minutes past the hour, says he's 
What makes me so passionate about music and photography and how do I manage to keep up your high drive? Oh, that's a good question. It's greetings from Vienna. I've actually snuck in. in. I've actually snuck into the Vienna Opera House. Um, what makes me so passionate about music and photography? Well, when it comes to music, I come from a very musical family. My parents were both musicians. They both play piano and keyboards. Dad plays violin. They met in a chorus. They met in the choral group. I mean, my grandma was Henry Steinway's personal secretary for like 30 years back in the days of the age of the immortals. My father's parents also met in the chorus. Uh, we played music all through you know, graduate school, like grad after we graduated college. It's really important to us. I mean, it's part of our lives. So we love music. And I've always loved music and everybody should love music. It's sad that today that people don't really hear music and music is only a side thing that's played while they're doing something else. As opposed to me, as I said, rather than doing this video, you guys are complaining, oh, there's enough light on my face. Well, look, I'm doing you guys a favor here, assuming you're watching. I'd rather be sitting there goofing off my eyes closed just watching the music. Because you know, when you listen to music, I say, when I listen to music, I close my eyes and I can see everything. I can see what's going on in the music. And about photography, you know, I really like, I've always liked photography. What makes me excited is I like to make stuff. I really like to build stuff. I like to create things. And it's just fun being able to take my vision here and put it into a tangible form as a photograph. Keep my drive high. I'm just that way. I worked with a guy once with a PhD in chemistry. And he was saying how when they work in chemistry, they work in laboratories where there's dangerous chemicals. And they have these little vials of stuff to protect them if they take some poison that hopefully just, it's like a super ultra stimulant that keeps them like, buzzed until like emergency services comes and can figure out what the heck happened. And when he first met me, he thought I had somehow taken that because he said when he was a college student, sometimes they just take it for fun if they were bored. <laughs> he thought for sure that I was high on this stuff. But no, I'm just naturally very energetic. I'm just a happy guy. I like being happy. I like having a great attitude. And you know, life is good. Life is good. You know, we got iPhones. Everybody's got all the information in the world they want. It's all good. Again, Ken Rockwell here live at KenRockwell.com and KenRockwell.tv. I'm answering all of your questions live. If you just put them in the comments section, I'll get to them in a few minutes. Uh, right now, I'm answering a question that came in at 39 minutes past the hour. What do I think of the Ryko GR3? I'll admit, I have no idea about the Ryko GR3. I know Ryko has been making cameras forever. My parents' first cameras were Ryko Flex, twin lens reflexes they got in the 1950s when they were kids. Um, so it's not a company that just makes copying machines, but honestly, I don't know. Ryko has specialized in making uh, odd little point and shoots that I'm sure some people love that have medium to large sensors with fixed lenses. But honestly, you'd have to try it. And again, if you really think you want one, you can do what I do, just buy it, try it out. If you hate it, you can send it back. If you use the stores that I use, which are linked in my website, kenrockwell.com, click links. Okay, Gary Cully asked at 39 minutes past the hour. So instead of Z6 II, which Canon to leave Nikon? Well, it depends what you want. If you want to upgrade to Canon, honestly, the EOS RP, which has a price of about $1,000 for the body, is a great little camera. It's not for sports and action, but for nature and landscape, it works great. And what I like about it is it's half the price of anything else that's out there, and it's just about as good. And I'd actually rather shoot an EOS RP over anything from Sony or anything from Fuji, because the picture is going to look better and it's going to handle better. Although if action was involved, oh gosh, the R6 and R5 are so fast, it's awesome. Uh, the EOS R was the first mirrorless Canon full frame. It's a good camera. It's a middle-of-the-road camera. It's kind of a cross between the R5s and the EOS. And I bet you nickel that the EOS R is a lot less expensively now than when it came out. But they're all good, uh, if that helps anymore. And also, I have some pages on my KenRockwell.com website where I compare the various Canon cameras. Ken, what is my favorite camera lens combination? Felix Wang asked at 40 minutes past the hour. Oh, that's tough. Favorite? I don't even know anymore. Because cameras just come and go faster than like, honestly, I like my Canons, my Canon EOS, excuse me, my, my 5DSR. I love my 5DSR. And if you go to my website, I've got links. People are selling these brand new now for $1,500. It's the highest resolution Canon ever made, 50 megapixels. It works just awesome. So I like the 5DSR for modern cameras, for classic cameras. I also like my Hasselblad two and a quarters. Just they're so well designed. The results are so awesome. Or maybe I should say, you know, honestly, what my favorite is? If, okay, boom, Rockwell, you're in a desert island, rest of your life, you get one camera to pick. It's going to be the iPhone that is shooting this right now. That, because why? Because it's always with me. And the pictures look awesome. And I can process them and edit them on the iPhone. And then I can publish them from the iPhone. All the old-fashioned cameras, like all these digital cameras, it's great. The Japanese think that, oh, we're going to put a, a, 
We're gonna put a crappy app on it so you can like get things to your cell phone. Oh, so when you get it to your cell phone, then you can try to make it look as good as if you shot it on the iPhone in the first place and then actually post it someplace. Why not just shoot it on the iPhone? Gary Cully says, leaving Nikon, oh my. Maybe it's talking about me. Actually, I've been dissing on Nikon probably ever since 2013 or so, whenever the 5D Mark III came out, maybe 2012 or so. And when they came out with the version two firmware, then everything worked really awesome. I'm like, oh, this is so much better than Nikon because Nikon had like D810, D800, kind of wasn't awesome for ergonomics. And ever since then, I've been a Canon guy. What camera can I live without? Lucas, Lewis asks, honestly, the iPhone. I think like most people, if my iPhone isn't with me, I freak out because it's my link to the universe. All the other cameras I can do without, honestly. The iPhone pretty much does everything. Remember when I got rid of my Noblex two and a quarter rotating lens panorama camera. Why? Because the iPhone in rotating panorama mode gave me higher resolution, better files more easily than mucking around with film. Uh, Lewis adds, he says, I'm right. Most YouTubers are just good at telling stories and half of them pushing new cameras. Ken is honest. Honestly, that's why I'm here. Thank you very much, Lewis Luzuka at 42 past the hour. Lewis says, true, and acting people, acting not telling everybody how booked and blessed they are, busy people too busy to tell others they are, okay. Yeah, you know, we're all blessed, we're all alive. <laughs> That's the main thing. I remember it was so sad when Steve Jobs passed away just a little over 10 years ago. And I was playing with my kids at the jumpy house, the indoor jumpy house place, whatever they call that, some sort of playland. I think, you know, Steve Jobs is like the coolest guy in the world. He's multi-trillionaire. Everybody loves him. I and mean, how many grown-ups get on stage and people are just fainting over him and screaming and yelling. And then when he passed away, I'm like, wow, I'm doing better than Steve Jobs is right now. Because Steve Jobs passed. You know, we all should realize that. Think of your favorite guy, your favorite trillionaire, favorite rock star, whatever, who's dead now. Well, would you rather be them or rather be you now? Because you and I are actually still alive. And so no matter how bad things may be for you or how good they are, we're still doing a lot better than everybody else who's, who's passed on before us. Okay, again, Ken Rockwell live here. KenRockwell.com, KenRockwell.tv. And I'm answering all of your questions about anything, although people know me for photography. If you just put them in the comments section, I'm... Look at this giant... I hope this doesn't freak you guys out, this giant worm here. Step it up at 43 after the hour. It says, really respect my opinion on things and have purchased because of it. Well, thank you. Hopefully, as you can see, I'm honest. I could care if you guys buy anything or not. I'm just honest and try to share my knowledge. And apparently, I'm fairly talented at taking really complicated technical things and just explaining them. And also looking at things objectively because I don't read marketing materials because most of it's baloney. Aside my iPhone, do I always leave the house with the camera, Lewis asks. Well, I do because you people insist that I review everything, including things like Pentax and, and Panasonic, which I haven't even gotten to yet. So yes, there's always something I'm reviewing. For instance, this week it's the, uh, the Canon 14 to 35. I have a full review on it at KenRockwell.com, but you'll notice it's not really that full yet. So <laughs> I need to add a lot of stuff to that review, as well as I'm gonna be taking that lens to Yosemite and hopefully getting some awesome shots with it and adding that to my review. Hello from Brazil. I have an uncle in Brazil, Cover, living in uh, Brazil. There says Maro at 244, or I should say at 44 after the hour. Lewis says, what are my thoughts on the 16 millimeter pancake RF lens? I think it's an awesome idea. I don't know how well it's gonna work. I'm sure it works really well. And in that case, it's a full frame, ultra wide, non-distorting lens. That's a real freedom lens. Canon has been really clever in introducing mirrorless lenses. See, I'm always looking here at me, but I should be looking over here at you guys. The 16 f 2.8 RF lens from Canon is really brilliant because it's a tiny weightless lens. It's an ultra wide. It fully takes advantage of the fact that it's a mirrorless system. And that one tiny lens should in most systems be able to replace even this compact 14 to 35. So now you have a lens that's only this long, that's only this long in front of the camera. And you can leave this lens at home if you're bringing say a 24 to, to anything zoom. You don't need the range between 16 and 24. So unless you're only gonna take your 14 to 35 and then your 100 to 400, the 16 is brilliant and not just its own self, but because when you assemble a system, and I have a, an article on assembling a system at kenrockwell.com where I go into more detail on this, it allows you to use just that one tiny little pancake lens instead of the big zoom if you're carrying other lenses. And for me, the lighter you can be, the more relaxed you're gonna be, the further you're gonna go in a day, and the better your pictures will be. I'm very serious. The less you carry, the better are your good pictures going to come out. 
And again, Ken Rockwell answering your questions live here, kenrockwell.tv. Just put your questions in the comments section. I'm going to read them on my screen here. Oh my gosh, I have a Russian Cyrillic name here, so I won't try to pronounce that. Uh, it's 44 minutes past the hour. He said, hey, Ken, how about new cameras in the recommended category or better on your website? You're right. I have been delinquent in updating my best camera section, probably because new cameras and lenses come out so fast because everything has gone mirrorless. The camera companies are working triple overtime so that, <coughs> excuse me, working triple overtime, trying to crank out a whole new lines of lenses. Sony came out, it took them five years and got a full line of lenses, Nikon and Canon have been cranking them out. So that's why I haven't really done my best camera se section or haven't updated since. Bri briefly explain high light weighted metering in Nikon DA10. Yes, high light weighted metering, quite simply, instead of trying to give you the best looking picture overall, attempts to make sure that none of the highlights overexpose. So if you have a highlight like this tree over here, it tries to make sure that that'll never get too bright. So highlight weight of metering in contrast to light will make a darker picture than the other metering modes because it's expecting you to take that image and edit it after the fact to bring up the darker sections yet retain detail in the highlights. And that metering, it's appropriate too for shooting JPEGs or RAW because even JPEGs can be edited just fine. That's how I shoot everything. I shoot some JPEG. Can be edited just fine and lighten the shadows while preserving the highlights. Were I view the Pixel 6 Pro? Probably not. Again, that's kind of a junk brand cell phone. Apple invented the iPhone and invented the smartphone. Everything else is really just a copy. So I just don't have time to review a Pixel 6 Pro. Uh, that's also a junk operating system. I forget if it's Android or whatnot. The sad thing is, talk to people who own those other, the, the lesser brands of smartphones. With these Apple iPhones, they always work great. And even though Apple always comes out, the sad thing is the most exciting things they can say when they introduce them is 40% faster, or is up to, up to 40% faster, up to 80% faster. Honestly, Apple doesn't make any junk. And I have an iPhone 6S, and I updated that the latest operating system, and it works great. Everything works just fine, because Apple really cares about us instead of trying to make sure that our, <laughs> that our phones start working crappier and crappier and crappier as time goes on, like Windows-based computers, which always get the, the, the viruses and so forth. And so, People who own non-Apple phones always seem to become unhappy with them because they get slow. I've never had an Apple phone be slow. All my Apple phones work awesome. Even like, I don't know, I've never had any complaints. My iPhone 3GS, I think I bought as a goof back then. And so the junk brand iPhones, whatever they call them, like Androids and LG or whatever those are, I'm sorry, I just don't get excited by them. Also too, I went to the Verizon store and I got my iPhone 13 Pro Max here, make sure everything was groovy, which it was. I, didn't need, I was using the same SIM card for my iPhone 12 for 5G, but uh, as a bit of word to the wise, if you're coming from anything other than a 12 or a 13, a pre-5G phone, you can just pop your SIM card in when you get your new phone and it'll work just fine, but it won't take advantage of all the best 5G, whatever stuff, secret sauce that Verizon has cooking in their network. So pop into the Verizon store, it's free, and they'll swap out, give you a new SIM card, which will take advantage of all the, uh, the 5G innovations. I will admit though, when I was in that store, I saw some folding phones and I thought that was cool because a phone the size of the iPhone would double open into something the size of like an iPad mini. I'm like, oh, this is cool. And I'm thinking, wow, I wish Apple were to do so folding phones. But then I thought a little bit. Number one, doing a little bit of research, turns out none of those phones are sealed. So all the waterproofing we take for granted ain't happening with those. But the other thought was, I'm thinking, right now I'm working on glass here and it's not even glass, it's hardened ceramic or some other like magic space age material on the front of my iPhone. You know, a folding screen, it's not that they, I wouldn't even say it's really folding, which would imply a crease. I always thought there was a crease. No, it's actually a radius. It's just folded over, kind of like in New York City. We you know we fold our pizza. So that was great. You unfold it, and it's just a, a flexible screen. I would call it a flexible screen. But then I said, hold on, glass doesn't bend. So I'm thinking that means that flexible screen is made of plastic, which means in about a month and a half, with my finger on it all day long, it's going to become milky and yucky looking. So, so much for that. But sorry about that. Not that I wouldn't love to play with a Pixel Pro, but I just don't have the time. Badger asks at 45 past the hour, what's the cheapest wide-angle lens that he can get away with for lightning forks the DX? Oh, I like the way you've posted this. It's cheapest wide-angle. Oh, the cheapest is the best. The Nikon 10 to 20 millimeter, I think it is. It's about $300. It's really a marvelous lens because most systems don't have inexpensive ultra-wide lenses for several years until they've been introduced, like Nikon. It's clueless. Nikon has absolutely no inexpensive ultra wide zooms for their mirrorless cameras. But yeah, get the Nikon AFS 10 to 20 millimeter 
lens for the Nikon DX system works awesome. Again, Ken Rockwell answering your questions live here, kenrockwell.com. Just put them in the comments. Tan Sedona asks at 45 after the hour, how about Lumix? Is it a good camera for landscape? Honestly, I've never shot Panasonic. Seriously, I don't know. I would love to. Panasonic once in a while had talked to me saying, hey, can we send you some cameras? And if they did, I would cheerfully review them. But I just haven't tried them. Panasonic, I have to respect Panasonic. I'm, I'm stretching my shirt here. It's looking tacky. Panasonic, when I worked in Hollywood, a lot of people didn't realize when it comes to professional video, Panasonic has always been nipping at Sony's coattails forever. Panasonic is a brand to respect, part of National. Uh, I'm thinking Panasonic Technic stereo stuff uh, back in the old days. Panasonic makes good stuff. And I would love to play with the Lumix cameras. I just haven't had the chance. So I apologize for that. On the other hand, I don't think it's a mainstream camera. That's a good point. I'm thinking what's really good is the reason I use Photoshop is it's always been a mainstream brand so that I can always get advice and help on it because everybody uses it. Uh, so if you want to buy used equipment or get advice from people who are competent, that's why I'd stick with Canon or, or Nikon. So I, I wish I could help better. <laughs> but honestly, try it. Try it for yourself. Just know it's a lesser, lesser brand. Keith asks at 45 after the hour, how much more about CAC can I give with the Fuji 3314 than the 3520? Negligible. Negligible. If you're shooting on the same format, honestly, one stop of difference makes very little difference. People don't realize that, but it's almost, it almost isn't even visible. And there's probably more difference between the two lenses than... Well, more difference in character of the bouquet than the actual out-of-focusness. So I wouldn't go break the bank. But again, I'd buy it from B&H Adorama or even Amazon or Crutchfield as well. Crutchfield as well has been around since the 70s. But back in the 70s, we bought Costera gear from them. Uh, they didn't sell cameras back then, but it's an awesome, awesome company. Get your lens and try it. If you hate it, you can send it back. Hey, R. Van Kulk says he's actually watching this in a 4K screen. So tell me, I'm shooting this on my iPhone, my iPhone 13 Pro Max. I'm shooting it in YouTube's, in the YouTube app on my phone. I just hit the live button. How do I look in 4K? The last I've seen of these videos is it really look like they're maybe at 720 or even 480 probably based on how much data my little phone can spit out on its own here. Uh, but I'd be curious, uh, what does it look like? It probably looks pretty crappy. In fact, in the, the return I'm getting here on the screen looks pretty crappy too. However, my regular videos, uh, if you're watching in a real 4K screen, when I show you my sample images, those are at 4K and beyond. 4K and beyond. Those, I watch it on an 85 inch Sony 4K TV. Those look awesome, but few people actually are gonna watch on 4K. Lewis writes, 46 after the hour, his friend went to Paris with an R5 and 15 to 35 to 8, came back home from the trip and sold it for the iPhone 13 Pro Max 1 terabyte. His reason was he barely used his, <laughs> rarely uses R5. Doy of thoughts? Oh, he said he barely used the, the big camera because of size, weight, museum restriction. Thoughts? I agree with your friend. You know these old-fashioned cameras, which means like the, the EOS R3 and the Nikon non-existent Z9? Those are from a, a, a quieter time. Back when old people, well, I guess when, before, back when old people were first invented and old people are now, the old people of today were like young people back then. We had no choice but to shoot big, ugly cameras. Today, the iPhone works awesome for most things. The reason I shoot the big cameras is, is there's some things that the big cameras can do. Like if I want to shoot a bird three miles away, you know, the iPhones really don't have long telephoto lenses yet. And even if they did, I think only Apple would be able to figure out how to let us actually track somebody with like the 300 millimeter equivalent by holding a phone at our arm's length. But it's just a smaller set of circumstances where you'd need the large camera. Now that I, I'll admit, I said my iPhone 13 Pro Max was shooting in the dark a couple days ago. It's awesome. Even shooting motion. I'm shooting my son flying a remote controlled airplane at night and I'm lighting the airplane with the flashlight. And somehow the iPhone, and it's, 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 you know, it takes three seconds, you know, multiple exposures, somehow caught the airplane still. There's no way a Canon or a Nikon or a Sony or Fuji can do that because those cameras just aren't smart enough. <laughs> Apple is smart enough. Notice too, Apple is smart enough. They got a, what, 12 megapixel sensor, which is more than enough for anything. And by processing that at however many frames per second, they can get the amazing results of tomorrow. So yeah, I think th these old cameras are great, but uh, I don't think we necessarily need them. Again, it's funny, me talking about old cameras, like Nikon Z9, Canon R3 are old style cameras. They're pretty much non-connected cameras. 
They're just big, ugly, and clunky, and they're not very smart compared to what an iPhone does. Ken Rockwell, just ask me your questions in the comment sections, and I will get to them live in a few minutes. I'm running about 15 minutes by now. Lewis says, oh, Vancouver. Lewis, I was always wondering where you were from. Lewis, a uh, frequent commenter on my YouTube channel at 47 after the hour, says, from Vancouver, Canada, eh? Been learning from me since t before 2007. Wow, when he got his first Rebel in high school. Well, thank you so much, Lewis. I didn't realize that about you. It's fun. All the fun people that comment on my YouTube, I never really know who, wh where they come from, which is always great when you guys write me that. Ian Arneson at 47 asked the hour. Asked me if I trade a Nikon 21.8 and 1635 for the 1424 Nikon. Excellent question because I have a strong answer. And the answer is absolutely, positively, lutely not. I would not trade for the 1424 2.8 Nikon. I hate my 1428, 14 to 24 of 2.8 Nikon. Why? Well, because it's the oldest lens of the batch here. The 14 to 24 2.8 came out in 2007 along with the Nikon D3, and it was a world beating lens. It was the world's first lens at 14 millimeters that was actually sharp out in the corners on a digital camera. It was a landmark lens. The problem was it's huge. It's like this, it's like this big around. It's like four inches around on the front. And it's got this huge bulbous front end. There's no way to put a filter on that. Guess what? As soon as you can't put a filter on it, and you have this huge bulbous front end, means you now have a laboratory curiosity rather than a lens you can really shoot all day, every day. Why? Well, because if you can't protect it, it's gonna get damaged. And now you're always worried about that. And if you do damage it, you're in big trouble because anything that happens on that huge front element will probably be visible in your pictures. If you get a scratch on a telephoto lens, it doesn't matter, although it freaks people out. You get a scratch on an ultra, ultra wide lens, the problem is that number one, that, that front element is so huge and so far away from the, the nodal points, and also the depth of field is so great that you will see crud, uh, even fingerprints will make dark areas. So I would not get the 14 to 24. And so the answer to your question is absolutely not. I keep the 21.8 and the 16 to 35. I love those lenses. Uh -huh. Cameras, honestly, 249, uh, 249 after the arrow, Lewis asks, what cameras are I loving? You know, pretty much anything from Canon and most stuff from Nikon. Sony and Fuji mostly bring me pain. Uh, my Apple brings me joy. Everything from Canon brings me joy. And Nikon, it's kind of love-hate. If I'm shooting it for a week, then I usually get used to its quirks and I love it, but it just doesn't feel right buying anything from Nikon that's not made in Japan. Or anything from Japan that's not made in Japan. Sorry, but that's one of the rules of my house here. Ah, Lewis says, how do I stay present in the moment instead of chasing the next achievement lens? Simple. I have to shoot for a living. I can't dream about cameras that don't exist because then I can't take pictures and I'm out of luck. So I just don't even care. I guess to me, I know the difference between real and fake. And so therefore what's fake is what I can't actually buy. If I can't order something, it doesn't exist. I have an order in for the R3, that's fine. Nikon Z9, who cares? Can't order it, don't care. Marcel asks at 49 past the hour, what lens do I use for theater photography? You know, I haven't done theater photography since college. Thinking about six, switching from a 60D with kit lenses to R5 or R6. Ah. Theater photography, well, you want fast and you want moderately long, like a 135, yeah, like a 135 F2. Stabilization would be a big help. At this case, you know, but the beautiful thing is I was shooting film back when I was in college. That's all we had. Hmm. Life was tough. Honestly, hold on. Well, digital tape's all good. 7200 F2.8. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> by a good EF lens. You know, you actually could buy a good EF lens because they work flawlessly on the Canon mirrorless. Yeah, go look. In fact, you could buy a U7200 2.8. That would probably be really good. It really depends what angles of view you want, but having a 2.8 would probably be pretty handy because people are moving around on stage. But what is awesome for theater photography, R5 and R6 can work completely silently, and that's huge. Ah, Step It Up says he still loves his Mamiya 6, and I love mine too. Mamiya 6 is a two and a quarter folding, or collapsible lens, I should say, electronic camera from the 90s, and I love mine. Henri Gentil, or Henry Gentles asks, at 25 past the hour, old Leica R lenses? Uh, obsolete. I never liked the Leica R system. It was always inferior. Leica was always playing catch up to the Japanese, and that's why Leica pretty much eliminated the R system and destroyed it and just admitted it as a big failure and no longer exists today, it was a dunce. Uh, things were big and clunky. The technology is such that their lenses were not any better than everybody else's lenses. So I would say forget Leica R. In fact, because collectors get excited by Leica R, 
the prices are too much, so I'd skip it. Lewis asks at 51 FDR, is it hard to feel grateful all the time when you try every candle that comes out? Or you still feel excitement. I feel excitement. It's super fun. How could it not be? But as soon as I get like a Sony out, I mean, God bless them. It's just not my cup of tea. It's just crappy menu system and feels crappy in hand. And I do not look forward to shooting Sony. In fact, the last A7 Mark IV I had, it was really slow. And I don't know if other people have seen the same thing, but everything I did took half a second to respond. You turn the dial, it takes half a second to respond in the viewfinder. I'm like, what am I, a moron? I'm going to wait half a second for the viewfinder to catch up with me setting F8. And the reason that's in troublesome is, is imagine trying to drive your car and every time you turn the wheel, it, it waited like a tenth of a second or an eighth of a second or a quarter second to like actually make the wheels change. You can't drive a car that way because you need to have it real time, no delay. Imagine if Michelangelo was painting the Sistine Chapel ceiling and every time he touched the paintbrush to the surface, it took a quarter of a second for him to see the result that that had. Now imagine, he couldn't just, he wouldn't just be a quarter second slow. He'd be a quarter second slow for each and every possible minute variation he made. And if that was the way he had to paint, he would still be painting it to this day. So likewise, I have zero appreciation for any camera that has other than zero time delay from when I turn that button to when it actually reflects in the viewfinder or anything else. Okay, it's now 15 minutes past the hour and I am answering questions. You know, I, I'm gonna need to step it up here a little bit because you guys are asking more questions than I'm able to answer. Okay, Mr. Chen says, thank you for my reviews. Thank you. John says, th thanks you for my reviews. He shoots a D50 IR. Ha ha, D3300 full spectrum IR, chrome filter for fun. Full spectrum camera with a normal IR. No, I, well, actually, yes and no. Uh, ma major camera companies, yeah, they call them astronomical versions. And they have wider band, sen well, not wider band sensors, but they don't put the filters on. So they allow you, the astronomer, to put filters on and, and limit it yourself. Batur Major says, uh, 52 after the hour, loves my work, man. I'm the go-to photo camera guy like Gerald Undone is for video cameras. Thank you so much. JP says he bought the EOS RP based on my reviews and he loves it. Thank you. Hey, Amsterdam says hi. He's been following me since he started my photography adventure years ago. Thank you for all your advice. Well, thank you. Thank you, sir. Adrian Russell says he's appreciated my learn me. Blah, 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 blah. Really appreciated and learned from me over the past years. For general purpose, would I recommend a 200 to 300 prime lens would be on an icon? Actually, I would. it's like a trick question. I would not recommend any fixed telephoto lens at 200 to 300 millimeters for an icon simply because zoom lenses since the 80s have been more popular and for good reason. When you're shooting a long distance away, just walking to change the zoom isn't very efficient. So I would say get an 80 to 200 or an 80 to 400 for an icon. I would not get a fixed 200. Yes, Steve Jobs passed away. Sorry about that for all. Lewis asked, 57, his Nikon's D700's favorite camera for portrait uses dad's old manual 52, 10525, but his CF card doesn't read anymore. What camera should I get next? You know, you could send your D700 out for repair. I remember back when I had little kids, he managed to bend off all the pins in my D70 by trying to put a CF card in sideways. And I didn't think it could be done. My son tried, he got it in, but he also bent all the pins. Didn't realize how quickly the camera became totally useless without being able to read a card. Uh, I would consider sending your D700 in for repair. Otherwise, get next for DSLR. You know, why not look at like a D800, D810, or even a D850? D850 is the king. Okay, Pogo Kilgram says it's 58 after the hour. Whoa, live Q&A of our king. So what like a lens these days appeal to you most, Ken? You know, my Leica lenses appeal to me most. I always grab when I go shoot Leica, a 21, a 35, a 50, and a 90. For 21, if I'm shooting my film, if I'm shooting film, I shoot my 21 f4 Super Angulon because it has a 39 millimeter filter. It matches everything else in my kit. I shoot the 35 f2 Summicron with the two goggles on them for my, again, these are all 1950 lenses for my M3. I'll shoot a 50 f2. Actually, I shoot my 50 f2 uh, dual range macro on my M3, which includes goggles for close focus. And I'll grab whatever 90 millimeter tends to be handier. If I'm shooting on a digital Leica, which I hate because the Leica digitals are awful, then I'll shoot my 21 millimeter 3.4, uh, whatever the latest Summicron AS a spherical is, 30, 21 F3.4. I'll shoot the, th the current 35 F1.4 spherical. I'll shoot any of my 50 F2 Summicrons and whatever 90 I feel like grabbing, which is usually one of the more compact slower ones. Cool Beans Dude asks, bought the EF 100, 200, 
EF100 to 400 version 2 based on my view and it's super great. Yes, I love my Canon EF100 to 400 millimeter ISVR version 2. It's all metal. It's, in my opinion, the best telephoto lens made in the history of the earth. So there. Light Living KTT, as of 58 after the hour. Thank you for my honest, clear, and objective explanations. Thank you. 58 after the hour. Recently picked up a used Fuji FC 50 to 230. Been blown away by the snaps. And he loves his other cameras too. Thank you. Lewis says he's honored to be here. I changed his life. Wasn't expecting me to be live today. I wasn't expecting to be live today either, but considering I just finished my review yesterday of my 135 soft focus Canon lens, I figured I had the day off. But no. Again, Ken Ronco here answering your questions live. Just put them in the comments. Okay, someone is a Canon 5D Mark IV. Actually, Hip Hop for Kids does. Someone wants to trade him for Sony A7 III. What is my opinion? Being the already on two A92 for work. Well, honestly, I'd try to trade you too. I wouldn't. I don't like Sony cameras, so I keep the 5D Mark IV. You really have to ask yourself. Although, if you've already got two A9s, and if you like them, well, why would you need an A7R III? That's a good question. Why would you need the Canon? So, you know, that's a tough one for me to ask. Lewis, are still worth carrying around? No. Uh, the iPhone if your place is all... Cold Dublin, Ireland. I'm sorry that it's cold up there. Sorry, but gotta love Ireland. Ireland's awesome. Kevon asks, his mom still has an iPhone 6S with a new battery. She still loves it. Yes, the iPhone 6S is great. It's a little camera. I do like the curved edges on it, and it's small. And although the new cameras do more things, admittedly, if you just want to, you know, search email, do the web, do all the apps that you love to do, other than just creating pictures on it, which, of course, well, all of us here are creating pictures, but for everything else iPhone 6S works great. An iPhone 13 mini. No, I got the iPhone 13 Pro Max because I'm half blind at close distances. And the bigger the screen, the merrier. Uh, not the battery. Just for me, it's the screen. The bigger the screen, the better. I wish that the iPhones, instead of having these long, skinny, whatever. The only part I can see on my screen here now is, let me do this. You're probably seeing a 16 by 9, but I'm seeing the, the size of the iPhone. <laughs> the iPhone screen only shows this much. I wish it was taller, like the size of an iPad mini or wider, because I've got big hands and I could hold a much bigger phone that was wider when you hold it vertically. But that's just me. You know, God bless Apple. They make so many different variations that no matter what you want, I'm sure they have it. Okay, Camera Punk says from Chicago, thank you for all my wonderful vids. My question is, why am I so awesome? Because my parents are awesome. Ha 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 ha. What do I think of the Pentax K3 Mark II? I, I forget. The last time I tried a Pentax digital camera, it was so many decades behind the other guys. I mean, things like these giant LCD displays and the finers and just stuff that made no sense. And it, it had clunky autofocus. And it's just, I'm thinking Pentax is really only bought by, Pent, by old people who still own Pentax lenses from like 1980s or 90s and want to use them on their camera instead of actually just getting with the program. But that's me. You know, I don't have those old Pentax lenses. Okay. Kevon asks, do I think I'll do YouTube versions of my most pop? No, uh, yes and no. There's only so much time in a day, and so I'm doing YouTube versions of all my current camera reviews that I do, but I'm not going back and redoing old ones. In fact, if I do redo old ones, I'm going to redo film camera, my 35 millimeter cameras, because apparently there's nobody. All the YouTubers really aren't experts in any of this film stuff, and there's very little out there other than just like young people who, you know, have never seen a Nikon FM before and don't remember when it came out and don't really know how to use those cameras. Kind of like Mercedes. I have been a Mercedes owner since like, oh gosh, for like 30 years now. And there's just some stuff of the way Mercedes work, at least real Mercedes, the way they work and how things are done, which is very different from the rest of the world. And YouTubers try to, you know, it's funny, they come across stuff and don't know how it works. Like, why does it only have one windshield wiper? Well, because that's the best way to do it. Stuff like that. So yeah, I probably do 35 millimeter reviews and two and a quarter reviews rather than going old digital cameras. VR lens Canon just released. Uh, I know they just came out with a 100 to 400. I ordered and I'm waiting for mine. Boris writes, 5 after the hour. He just got his Z50 and two VR kit lenses. Good job. Great camera, but no IBIS. It doesn't need in-camera stabilization. Optical stabilization, stabilization is superior. And so you don't need IBIS. You don't have Z primes, don't have VR. You know, you don't need Z primes. Don't sell it. No, the Z50 and those two VR kit lenses, learn it and love it. Those are all you'll ever need. Those kit lenses are perfect. 
Oh, Lewis's birthday. Is it your birthday, Lewis? Well, happy birthday, Lewis. Lewis Lazuka up in, up in Vancouver there. Thank you very much. What do I think about Nikon D80 in 2021? The D80 is a completely obsolete camera, but the pictures look great. So it's, you know, if you've got one, love it. Capture One or GIMP? I'm sorry, I don't use either one of those. I could never figure out Capture One. Honestly, I'm a, what do I use for software? I love camera bits, photo mechanic. That's how I sort everything I shoot, including stuff on my iPhone. That's how I just see all that I've got. And then I drag what I like into Photoshop. And I use Photoshop CS6 from 2010 because I can't see the point of renting Photoshop. And I'm good. 720p here looks decent. You look swell. <laughs> Thank you. I think I look. How far can you see on my head? Because th my hair is going crazy today, so I cut it off. Greetings from Stockholm. Wow, I so want to get to Sweden. That's where my heritage is. That's where Hasselblad comes from. I have never been there yet. Although friends of mine from Sweden talk about how it's really hell most of the year, except for like two weeks in the middle of summer. I don't know. Oh, 4K comment here. A stream won't go above 720p, which makes perfect sense. Okay, Eric Leipold at seven minutes past the hour asks, what would I recommend for a digital compact range on a camera? I would recommend an iPhone. Uh, X100V, or I spend even more, say, like a Q2. Oh, God, no. Uh, Leica, as I've said before, in the 50s, actually in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and even with binoculars today, and uh, they probably make rifle scopes and so forth. First class, mechanics and optics, it's extraordinary. They're just a tiny little company, and honestly, the digital cameras are awful, so I would not buy a Leica Q2. X100V, absolutely. I love the X100V. I actually love the X100F older model even more. It's a great little camera. What makes the Leica stand out is it has a built-in flash, and because it has a leaf shutter, it synchronizes at a 4,000th of a second. And it would take a picture like this of me here. It would look beautiful, because a little built-in flash you don't even know is there. Poof, would light me up just fine. Something you can't do with a camera with a focal plane shutter. Okay, Pablo asks, at 8 after the hour, Canon RF 7200 2.8 versus F4 for kids and outdoor soccer games. No, honestly, I've, I've had this on my website someplace. I shot a 30... A, 80 to 200, 2.8, and an F4 against each other. The bokeh difference is almost invisible. So unless you're infinitely rich and like carrying around heavy lenses, and the beauty of the Canon RF lenses, is they're both fairly small, I get the F4. Martin asks, do I use RAW? No, I don't use RAW for anything. I don't use Lightroom for anything. I use Photoshop for everything. Yes, Lewis says it's certainly better to get a shot with an iPhone than no shots with an R5. Well, R5 shoots well. Clunky camera, or not. Okay. Players Caddy, nine after the hour here, asked my opinion earlier on Fuji GFX, but if all you ever do is shoot people, would I still not recommend? I don't like the colors, but if all I ever did was shoot people, I would very seriously consider the GFX, especially if I was working in a studio where it sat on a tripod all day long and assistants were handing it to me and loading up lenses. I would love to shoot the GFX in a studio with all my strobes. Uh, Michael writes, almost like Apple is processing raw pixel data, it is. You know, one of these days, for 20 years, I've meant to write an article. I just haven't had the time to do it. What is RAW and what is JPEG? People don't realize every camera starts off with RAW data. What comes off your sensor is RAW data. Every camera to make a JPEG, including your iPhone, including your, my kids' point and shoots, takes that RAW data and finesses it to make the JPEG, to make an image. And then once it has the raster image, then it processes it into a JPEG. Well, guess what? The processing it into the raster image before it's compressed into a JPEG, that processing is the same whether it's done on your computer or done natively in your camera. The difference is your camera does it natively in hardware instantaneously versus you having to dick around with storing all that data. It's like a hoarder with like 12 years of newspapers hoarding the data, having to load it into your computer, then using your camera in software and with a non-dedicated processor to try to process all that data into the raster data that you then call your picture. So that's why I don't use RAW, especially when my cameras can make great looking JPEGs directly. But that's just me, and this is art. Whatever looks works well for you, do it. Do I think Canon will update the RPR soon? I would not be surprised if we had a new RPR. But on the other hand, the fact that I can't shoot with anything that I don't have means I don't worry about that. Kavan loves his Nikon F, his Nikon F3 and SP. <laughs> Lewis wants an RP Mark II. Well, you know, we probably will get one, but then it's going to be probably twelve hundred dollars instead of a thousand or eight hundred, whatever the RP sells for. Never wait for a camera. Lucas asked about Lucas. Lewis asked about waiting for an iPhone 14. Waiting for an iPhone 14. They just came out with the 13. Uh, never wait for a camera. You have to shoot today. Shoot with what you got. 
Pentax or Nikon D100. Nikon D100 is obsolete. Don't buy either of those. <laughs> they turn them into a local police station. YouTube channels pushing Sony, tempting you to switch teams. You know, I don't... You know, Sony's really good. Uh, you know, if you like Sony, get them. And if you're a YouTuber and don't know any better, like I was talking to a pro who managed the photo department of one of the major United States newspapers. And she said how she had this Nikon Z6 she, she, that she had lost and was helping I could help her locate it with serial numbers and stuff. And I forget what, it, but I was at first I was humbled because I mean, when I tried the Nikon Z6, the autofocus was horrible. It was really bad. And on the Z7 Mark II, Z7, Z6 Mark II, still pretty bad. And so I was humble thinking, well, if it's good enough for this major, major, major United States newspaper, then I just must be an idiot and not know how to use it. But my life, it, my, my day was made when I spoke to her and she said, oh no, the reason it was stolen is because I gave them out to some of my staff. And some of the guy says, gosh, these are so awful. We're not shooting with it. And just gave them back to her, went out and bought their own cameras so they could actually get the job done. And so she had this camera sitting in her car, taking it back to the post office to return it and it got stolen from her car while she was waiting to return it. So that's why this major newspaper had Nikon Z6. So, you know, I'm sorry that nobody sponsors me and I actually tell you all these stories for real because I don't care if I tick off a camera company because they don't give me any free stuff. And that's good for you that they don't give you free stuff. This way I'm not pushing one brand to the other. Thankfully, I've been self-supported for all this time and supported, you know what pays the dollars for all this? Is when you guys get your stuff, if you're kind enough to use any of the links that I have on my website, that's what pays the bills. I get a kickback from those things, and that's what makes it work. And so I could care less if you buy anything or not, but if you're going to buy something, by all means, use those links. And that's why I really don't care what I say about whoever. And I can just be perfectly honest because that's the way I am. And the links are all the stores that I've used. I've used. My dad was buying from Crutchfield back in the 70s. I didn't have a car in the 70s, but dad would always say Crutchfield. They cost a little more, but the great service was always worth it. And today, Crutchfield doesn't cost anymore. B&H and Adorama, I've been buying from both of those guys personally since the 1970s when they first opened up in New York. And Amazon, well, we, we all use Amazon, so there's no, you know, that's not new to anybody else. Greetings from the Netherlands. I love, ha, <laughs> good job. Thank you, Marcel. Lewis asks, he's curious what my thoughts are on GoPros. Um, GoPros are a different market. I'm a photographic artist. My stuff, even when I'm goofing around, is fairly more cogitative than GoPros, which stick it on your head and go jump off of, jump off a building. Uh, so that's it. Would I ever do a photo review with Leica SL2? You know, one of my friends was given a free SL2, well, a promotional SL2, and he laughed. He says, why would I want this thing? It's just so big. Um, I, probably not. You know, if I had the time, but I don't think anybody really shoots those Leicas because they're expensive. Well, people do. People shoot them in studios. But, you know, I would if, if, if somebody offered me to borrow one, I, by all means, I'd review it. Thank, ah, Timothy, I'm glad you got my answer to the Z50. I love that you guys are able to watch this and respond. Yeah, looking at Canon, well, Z50 is slow to focus, but it's great for walking around in vacations. I would love, heck, I would take a Z50 on vacation. You know, Lewis asks, when is it time to upgrade a camera? Simple. It's only time to upgrade when you actually have clear, written reasons that whatever camera you have isn't doing what you want. If you think that the new camera is going to be sharper, here's a hint. It's not going to be any sharper. Newer cameras aren't any sharper than old cameras. Same thing for lenses, not going to be any sharper. The question is that you have to ask yourself when I say have a written, you don't have to write it, you know, I just, el el I can't even use words anymore. Elucidate, elaborate, enunciate. You've got to be able to say, I need this new lens because I don't have an ultra wide angle lens and I want to go take pictures of the inside of, of Grand Central Terminal. Or I need this, like if you don't even, we don't even need high speed lenses anymore because the digital cameras are so fast. You know, it's fun. I've been on the air for an hour and three quarters, you know, just for kicks, I'm shooting this live on my iPhone 13 Pro Max. I'm just using the native YouTube app. My camera's set up on a tripod here on my table, about only an inch, couple of inches in front of my face, which is why my face, for those of you who know what I look like, I don't look like this. It's like my nose is not giant, my face is not all round like this. But what was I saying? Oh, let me see if I can, I wonder if I can check the battery power here without actually cutting off my live stream, and I can't. Oh, okay, I'm at 52%. I'm at 52% battery. I started with 80% two hours ago. And the point is my screen's on the whole time. I am broadcasting live using the YouTube native app here on my iPhone 13 Pro Max, simply running off of its own internal battery. And it works just great. And one of my family's watching this too. 
Tom's Food Tour. Oh, that sounds good. I want to go on that. Tom's Food Tour writes, 19 past the hour. He's stepping up from iPhone video, looking for a flip screen. What is your... Rick? Go vlogging? Gee, Tom, you must be new to this channel here. Uh, the world's best camera for vlogging and for video is the iPhone. Why? Because its built-in stabilization is flawless. You can walk around, bump, bump, bump. It totally smooths it out. This video here you're seeing is not as good as you see using the iPhone itself for video because this is in YouTube's app and it's not applying all the smartness that the Apple video app does. In fact, whenever I use any third-party camera app, it just doesn't have the magic in processing the image that Apple does. For instance, if I was out in the sun, beating the sunlight you know, to death, it would actually prevent my face from getting blown out and the highlights and shadows and everything. So vlogging, iPhone. Oh, Shanghai, thank you so much saying hi at 19 after the hour. My page is his camera Bible, says uh, Geraldo Ramirez at 20 after the hour. Thank you, Geraldo. Why are you like a digital's crap? Well, they're not crap. Leica is the finest cameras on the earth next to Hasselblad's. The reason I say that they're crap for photography is Leica is a very small company and they're just buggy. They don't have the huge production budgets for development that Nikon and Canon and even Fuji have because they don't sell that many cameras. And so they don't have the in-house capabilities. They don't have the experience. And so digitals, the pictures never look that good. And even the way the cameras handle electronically is usually pretty buggy. And that's why. Leica is a lifestyle choice. Those of you who shoot Leica, you live good lives. Your income is so high, you don't even know what you make. You don't even know what the cameras cost. You just live the good life. And you have a Leica because it's who you are. It's not because you're trying to take pictures with it. Ah, okay. Ah, hey, compliment on the backyard I'm visiting here. Thank you very much. Native color, Ken Goler asked at 23 up there. What camera is the best native color? You know, what do you mean by native color and what do you mean by straight out of the camera? For people pictures, honestly, Fuji might be the best for skin tones. For nature and landscape, I prefer Canon and Nikon equally and Sony doesn't stand out for anything. Sony's just kind of middle of the road. All right, Lewis is 31 today. <laughs> what is something I wish you, I knew when I was 31 years old? I think I wish you knew everything I knew about dealing with people that I've learned today. I wish I knew that 31 years ago or, or when I was 31. Have you ever shot photogrammetry or interest in it? No, that's science. Uh, I'm an artist. Uh, thanks for the birthday wishes. Thank you, Louis. No, uh, Miller Chibamba. You know, my apologies, because these text is really small, far away on my phone, as little comments. Asset 25 after the hour. Is a Z50 anywhere close to D500 for wildlife and birds? Absolutely, positively not. D500 is Nikon's state of the art DX camera for fast autofocus and fast frame rates. It's awesome for wildlife and birds. In fact, it's better than any full frame camera because the smaller crop sensor lets you get better, bigger images of those little animals that you're trying to photograph. So D500 is way better. Live in paradise. You know, everybody should live in paradise. It's somebody asked, Paul says, you get a like or Pentax. Yes, you should. Um, Kevon, have I messed with the new picture styles feature? No, honestly, I have just got my iPhone 13. And as you guys probably know, taking, moving into the phone, you know, I, the best way to transfer everything over is use the directly wireless transfer from the old phone, which takes about three hours with all the stuff I have on it. The pictures have looked so good. I haven't even had the time because, you know, I'm living life is like, I haven't had the time to sit back and go twiddle around with the vivid photos. My fear is, is they always look so good to begin with that maybe I'll set, you know what? I don't know if Apple's done this or not. In fact, they, they already did. That's right. If I set everything to really vivid, it's smart enough to recognize people and faces so it doesn't turn skin tones ugly. So that could be incredible. I just haven't had time to play with it. So no, that, the answer to your question is no, I haven't. Hip Hop asks, great opinions. Thank you very much. By the way, still using Photo Mechanic. He should grow up. I appreciate you guys. Again, if it wasn't for you guys reading my stuff, I wouldn't be able to just kick back in an afternoon. I'd be out having to work a real job, so I really appreciate that. Do I have a dream collaboration? I'm not sure what that means. Okay. Nikon 40 F2 or 51.8 for a beginner. Uh, you know, I haven't seen the 40 F2 yet, so I don't know, but overall 51.8 is probably, oh, 51.8 S, that's a big ugly lens. So I would go 40 F2. Honestly, I would get a Canon and a 50 EF, an RF 50 millimeter for 1.8 because it's only, I think it was only $199 and it's one of the sharpest lenses on the planet. Ah, as Top Yal says, my wisdom is appreciated. Thank you. Well, you guys, readership is appreciated. 
Do any thoughts? Oh, Christoph Slicklinger at 32 after the hours. New opinion on the new Elegant TU-8200R. Would I specific any specific tube brands? You know, for tube stuff, Tube Depot is the place to go. TubeDepot.com. I know a guy there from photography, and he just happens to work at this tube place. Uh, you can call those guys. Or maybe not call. I don't, I don't know, but send them an email and ask them. They have every tube on the planet. They sell these Elegant uh, TU 8200R stereo equipment, in case you other guys don't realize what this is. I would ask the guys at Tube Depot what they'd recommend. Those guys are experts. Ah, Chris Orlando at Instagram. I think he already offers, you know, I appreciate that. I don't like to borrow people's cameras if they're expensive, like an SL2, because my fear is like borrowing a car that I would drop it. And I haven't dropped any cameras in decades, but that, you know, a fly would land on it and poop on it or something. I can't say that on the air here, but I feel horrible if I mucked up a friend's camera, so I'd rather try to borrow it from a manufacturer. Robert says, love my channel. Thank you. Upgraded to a 6D Canon. Our recommendation, never look back, now using R5. Love it all. Oh, running into storage issue, Robert asks. Well, when it comes to backup and storage, some of it is thinking ahead. I shoot JPEG and I shoot basic JPEG or normal JPEG on Canon so that the JPEG files aren't big. And because I do all that, my entire life's work fits into about five terabytes on my Mac Pro. Uh, my Mac Pro only is a terabyte, so I just have my programs on there and the photos I'm working on at, this, at the moment. Everything else is archived on an external eight terabyte hard drive, of which there's like a five terabyte partition. Anyway, yeah, I use external storage. Simple as that. iPhone with a simple gimbal will be incredibly stable. Guess what, Kavan? iPhone with no gimbals at all are incredibly stable. When you're actually shooting, it doesn't look like it's gimbaled because it's not yet. But when you're done shooting, the magic sauce inside the iPhone actually stabilizes it, locks it down like it was shot on rails. So I'd say try some panning shots or some tracking shots on your iPhone. Uh-oh, uh-oh, is the daylight moving here? Try some tracking shots on iPhone. Ha, I'm gonna track myself here. <laughs> Without a gimbal and see how you like it. Leica is the Harley of motorcycles. No, Leica is the BMW of motorcycles. They're German. What do I think of the new 35 Apo Sumo Cron M? First M's focus closer than, I don't know. Honestly, I haven't tried it. Jonas Kamakis at 30, 28, 38 after the hour asks. Oh, good. I'm almost getting caught up with the questions here. He just wanted to know that my site was first deep dive into photography technicalities. You will always thank me for that many years. Thank you. Thank you very much for reading my stuff. David Sutton asks, he just bought a Canon EOS R, no lenses. Should I buy RF or EF glass with the adapter? You know, that's a good question and it is an easy answer. If you have to buy something, I wouldn't buy EF lenses because they're for the DSLRs. And if you don't already have a DSLR, you're probably not going back to it. So I would only buy the R lenses or RF lenses because that's the future. On the other hand, if I already owned, and I do already own pretty much everything Canon does in EF lenses, I would be able to be much more picky about what I chose to go buy. And I wouldn't really have to, buy. the beauty of Canon is everything works. And so I wouldn't have to buy anything RF. I could just use my existing lenses. So I hope that answers your question. I wouldn't buy, although honestly for te ultra telephoto for pro use, I do prefer the EF 100 to 400 L2 over the RF 100 to 500 because of the build quality. Well, it's also heavier. It's made out of metal, the EF lens. And the EF lens works great with either the 1.4 or the two times original or Mark II teleconverters. And I even can stack them. You can't stack the Mark III EF converters, but you can stack the Mark II and the basic EF teleconverters. So I go that way. Favorite all-time Mercedes, the SL500 R129, I think it is. He just got one of the Canon 5 DSRs from Canon last month, brand new for $1,500. He loves it, Robert Panuti says. Yes, the best deal in photography right now is the Canon EOS 5DSR, my favorite DSLR ever, uh, which B&H has for about $1,500. It looks like they have them on limited stocks. So you have to order it and be patient. I paid like $3,600 for mine when it was brand new, and I still love it. But if I could have paid $1,500, that's great. Uh, when it comes to ND filters, do I buy it once? Yes. Uh, I used to use flat, uh, kind of like Hollywood style, uh, flat glass, of course, they're all flat rectangular filters and then I use them in adapters and they fit out all my lens. When did I leave Long Island? Um, I left Long Island in 1985. 
do I own or every shot with a box camera? Ever shot? Yes, a box camera from 1940s. Yeah, I bought them at garage sales. And I think some of my best pictures shot with my Agfa box camera. If you poke around and look for one of my Death Valley galleries, I shot black and white film and you know it came out looking awesome. Ah, Lewis says, thanks for spending his time with me. Well, this is Ken Rockwell. I'm live here. I've been live for two hours and I'm on kenrockwell.tv, kenrockwell.com. Uh, well, I, and I'm answering your questions live. If you put them in the comment section, I'll answer them. And to be honest, it seems like we almost have a little bit of a lull. And so maybe I'll sign off so I can go pee and catch my voice. Um, Lewis was asking if I could please save this live. Well, it's embarrassing for me, and I don't even know where this is cropped uh, with my crazy hair date. But usually what happens is, is I don't know, 20 minutes or so afterwards, I think my, my iPhone uploads whatever this video was. Oh, bye-bye, Marcel. Uploads this video to YouTube, and so it sadly will be preserved for all of eternity. I don't know if it's as much fun when it's not live. Let's see, it's already... <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? Because I think at this stage, I've got a little bit of a lull and I think I just might or might not sign off. Again, I love all you folks. Thanks for watching my stuff. You guys have been the reason I've been able to do this. I really appreciate the fact that you guys appreciate what I do. My biggest source of support is when you go and use any of the links from my website to get any of your stuff. You're using the stores that I personally use and personally recommend because I've been using them for decades and decades and decades. They're the best prices, the best service, always has been, and hopefully always will be. And admittedly, that is how I can keep doing this and give you all the information for free and not have to worry about sponsorship. Oh, Australia, I gotta love Australia. Eager Learner says he loves my insights. Thank you very much, or Eager Learner. Could be boy, could be girl, who knows? Thanks. Okay. Derek says, thanks for everything. Always appreciate my reviews. One question. Okay, here we go. I'll be here for another six hours. Which color and storage size iPhone did I get? You know, I got the gold iPhone and I got the one terabyte, which I think is more than more than enough. Even 500 gigabytes is probably more than enough. And you know, especially too, I was always, my music library, I've got, I don't know how many hundreds and hundreds of thousands of compact discs that I have painstakingly transferred into iTunes and transfer them into all my iPhones and then all my home videos. I'll be honest, now with Apple Music where I can pretty much pull everything completely losslessly off the air into my iPhone makes me question the necessity of having like my 400 gigabyte or whatever music library or 200 gigabytes, 20,000 songs, whatever that adds up to be, uh, manually in my iPhone as well as having all my kid videos. I didn't really ever watch my kid videos on my iPhone. But the key is my iPhone has more than enough storage for everything I could ever want to store on it. Today, with everything being streaming, and also I think my son is clogging up our iCloud account with all of his photos because he's just pushing those off to the cloud. Uh, I don't know how much storage you'd need. It's maybe it, it's it's more than enough today, and it's great to get. But I don't know if it's as necessary as it was in the past in terms of the color I got. Well, I got the iPhone Pro Max because I like the big screen and plus the cameras are spiffier. The telephoto lens goes longer on the bigger camera, and I got gold because I like gold. I like gold and tan and brown. Well, there's no tan involved here, but I like the tan cases or brown leather cases. And I prefer the leather cases over the, uh, the rubbery cases, the silicon cases, because the silicon cases are a bit grippy, but I find putting that into my pocket all the time, it's always grabbing in my pocket. And so admittedly, I always use a case. And once you put a case on the phone, you never can tell what color it is underneath, so that doesn't matter. But it is funny though, you ever notice in the movies, a lot of the corny stuff that you know isn't real, you'll notice no one in the movies ever has their iPhone in a case. And of course, movies have been around as long as the iPhone, so no matter what era of iPhone they're using, it's always just a bare iPhone. It's never actually in a case. My Mac Pro, you know, the great thing about Mac is my Mac Pro is from 2000, the early 2013 model that I got in 2014. And the most incredible thing about it was that it's silent. It's the first computer I know of and for the general public that actually worked without hard drives. And the fan ran really slowly. And so it was just stunning to have a, a as a music lover too, just have this computer, unlike my old Quad G5, which sounded like a helicopter going off because of its cooling fans and all the high processing power. The fact that the Mac Pro had no fans and just worked silently was awesome. Today, honestly, oh, even my iMac, I've got an iMac 5K. I got that about 2014, I think late 2014, the very first one they ever came out with. 
it is awesome. And the great thing about Apple is, is you don't have to buy one every month, every year and a half because it gets crappier. No, they work just awesome. In fact, I could update all my computers to the latest operating system from Apple. I just chose not to yet because my version of Photoshop, but most importantly, my version of Dreamweaver that I use for making my website, that won't work on the newest versions. And when I've tried the CC versions of Dreamweaver, they were awful. And so I'm kind of keeping back. Now we just signed, uh, you know, I may try to one of my other computers because I've got computers all the house with the newest Mac operating systems. But it's really, it's not Apple. Apple is awesome. Like even I updated my 2007 base model iMac, the cheapest one you could get back in 2007. Put a solid state drive and maxed out the RAM with third-party RAM. And that thing's still on Snow Leopard, iOS uh, OS 10.6, Snow Leopard. It screams, it wakes up in like 10 seconds and it screams and it runs the programs I need, but the older OS doesn't do some of the things I need. Grumman Tomcat, oh yeah, made on Long Island, love it. Asked, he got an FM2 a few months ago and been getting into photography. Hey, fun camera, thank you. Boris says, thanks for encouraging on the Z50. Great little camera. He's gonna ask me a question differently. Okay, how in my opinion, does the Z Prime perform in the Z50? You know, the Z Primes work great. The Z Primes are big and ugly and expensive, like the 51.8, 35.1.8. But the reason they're big and ugly and expensive is, is they're designed for incredible optical performance. It's like getting a Zeiss Otis brand, Zeiss Otis grade lens, but it's autofocus and works natively on the Z. So I don't really, I think it's kind of silly because they're full frame lenses. You're using them on a crop sensor camera and you're paying for a lot of lens and you're not really using it. Honestly, on the Z50, only lens I use, I can't say this enough, 16 to 50 zoom, and maybe the 50 to 250 zoom. Okay, ask me what my ultimate backup for photos is. Cloud storage or both? Honestly, I back up on multiple hard drives and store them in multiple locations. Opinion on getting images moving over to Canon R3 and AP or to using? You know, I don't know about that. Kind of like some people are saying, oh, our camera was approved by Netflix. You know, it doesn't matter. An artist creates whatever he does. And you know, most of Netflix productions are usually amateur anyway, shot in, sorry Canadians, but you know, shot in Canada, not Hollywood. So I wouldn't see that. How could Getty Images move over to Canon R3 when it doesn't even exist yet? And Getty Images, I mean, Getty asked me to join. I mean, he didn't tell me what camera to use. I think, I don't know, I have a sneaking suspicion that those are generated by the camera companies paying them to push them so that they can broadcast, they can like, kind of like B&W loudspeakers always used to advertise, oh, use it in all these studios, use it in Abbey Road Studios. Well, guess what? I'll bet you nickel that they came to Abbey Road and says, look, we're gonna pay you $50,000 a year to let us put our speakers in your studio so we can tell audiophiles that your speakers are used in the studio. And his businesses will be like, yeah, we can work with your, you know, B&W does make great speakers. They're like, yeah, we can work with your speakers. We'll let you pay us $50,000 a year, I suspect. But they don't ever publicize that. As opposed to, because nobody makes them publicize that. I think, you know, YouTube now asks if, you know, being sponsored. Well, I'm not being sponsored. I don't click that box. But, you know, YouTube is a thing saying, you know, if you're doing a sponsored post, like so much of this rubbish that, you know, people get free stuff in exchange for making YouTube videos or whatnot. So, can I speak to build a brand that is Ken Rockwell, Lewis asks. You know, just like when I used to have a real job. I used to work for Tektronix. And we had a credo, believe it or not, a company made stuff. And it says, you know, our... Our reputation is our most important asset. And you, our sales managers used to tell us, look, do everything in the long-term best interests of our customers. Don't just try to make your number this month in sales, but always think about the customer and think about him long-term. In other words, think about him years ahead. Think about what's gonna happen. You know, we could always sell anybody anything because people loved our equipment and Tektronix. We made television studio gear. But guess what? If we sold the guy something he didn't really need, three years later when he does his next build, and we show up, oh, hi, you know, we need to buy this. Then you've lost trust. You can only lie to a customer once. So it's always give you guys the best possible information I can give you guys. In fact, that came to me from my work in broadcasting. I saw that broadcasting gave people what they want. Maybe not what they need. Look at the state of television today. But <laughs> give people what they want. <laughs> yeah, my 2014 MacBook Air still edits 4K. Yes, my 2014 MacBook Air did edit 4K, but it took it a while. It's brilliant. The Apple operating systems are brilliant because it, it you're doing all your edits and it's just mat you don't even know it, but it's it's doing it in low resolution so it can handle it. And then when you go to render it, it, it that little MacBook Air, oh man, is I didn't even know how to do a fan. That little fan spins up. Love the 5K. Yes, everybody deserves to have an Apple 5K iMac. And if you're doing photography, you do. I use my Mac Pro. I just bought a 4K screen at Costco probably about four years ago, and I used that. 4K TV, no, I don't calibrate it because I don't care if it looks crappy for me and I think having a crappy screen or at least a sub 
perfective screen. It makes me work a little harder to make sure my image is gonna look good on every possible screen. The sun's moving. Oh, that was scary. I hope you guys weren't eating. Heaven forbid, I scare you guys here. Or as I was saying, but you know, if I was gonna be showing images to clients on my machine, then I would have one of those beautiful Apple monitors. But since I don't show images to clients on my machine, I just work with a crappy monitor. But again, iPhones, excuse me, iMacs, any of the Apple displays, your iPhone, your iMac are all calibrated at the factory, probably calibrated better than you or I could do by buying a dedicated calibrator. So I haven't used the calibrator ever since I started using Apple monitors decades ago. Uh, how long, ah, this is a good question. How long before cell phone cameras make regular cameras extinct? They never will. I have some articles about this. Every time something new comes out, even world changing, like an iPhone, it doesn't obsolete old stuff. Like my mom still has a phone glued to her wall with a wire on it. We still have hardwired phones. We still have the older media that still does what it does best. We still have newspapers and radio came out a hundred years ago. Radio came out in 1920s. People say, we're not gonna need newspapers anymore. Who would listen, who would buy a newspaper and we get the news over the radio instantaneously? Well, guess what? We still have newspapers. When FM radio came out, people said, oh, AM radio is doomed. Well, no, AM radio does some things better. Like it goes across the entire country. And I find even better than FM, it just covers the city better sometimes than, than an FM station does. So each medium continues to exist doing whatever it did best. Like film. Film has been obsolete for a couple of decades now. Yet people still buy Nikon FMs. They still shoot it because it's just some things it does differently and people prefer it. Oh, from Tokyo, Eager Learner. Bought a Canon PowerShot 720, $13. Excellent. Runs on two AAs. Excellent. Been having tons of fun taking pictures in his neighborhood. I don't need the latest. You know, for two AA batteries, what I suggest is, because you know those cameras usually go through a lot of AA batteries, get some nickel uh, metal hydride. Get some of the, not insure, Eneloop. Some of the Eneloop Sanyo or Panasonic now batteries. Or Sanyo? I forget who makes them. The Eneloop brand. Or all brands are now usually low self-discharge. You can run those things and they, even if you come back to them like a year or two later in the camera, it'll still be have its charge. That's a good way to go. Lewis, I didn't know you're a movie extra. Wow, you have to send me a message sometime. Let me know what movies you're in. Then I'm sure those movies are awesome. But yeah, it shows. What really shows is when they shoot Vancouver for San Francisco. I mean, like, it's obviously not San Francisco, but, <laughs> but you know, Netflix has to do whatever they can do to make their money and make their shows. Aren't even using, well, complain about Netflix shows. They're usually boring, but some of the video they shoot, it's just too sharp. And to do, I was gonna write an article saying, when everything's in focus, nothing's in focus. When it comes to cinematography, it's important to show what's, what happens is every time the scene changes, our eyes are always drawn to the sharpest, the most contrasty thing in that scene. So when you shoot a movie, you've only got one thing in focus. The viewer's eyes immediately go to that one thing and realize that that's what their attention is going to be focused on. Some of these Netflix shows, everything's in way too much focus. They're shooting, you know, trying to say, oh, we've got a 4K camera. Look at us. Everything's sharp. Well, guess what? When everything's sharp, nothing is in focus because the scene changes and your eye is looking all around trying to figure out well, where's the story here. So that's just me. Red fairly common, Ari or Panavision? Yes, Panavision, Ari are the best. Do people use high SO? You know, people do sometimes use high SO foam for random grain. Again, it's, it's an artistic decision. You can add noise in all the Photoshop programs. Let's see, I have now been running two hours and eight minutes. Let's give a, a battery check here. Shooting this live on my iPhone 13 Pro Max. My battery is, my battery is now at 45%. I started shooting this and broadcasting this live, powered only by the battery, at 80%. So I've gone down 35%. So I've only used one third of my charge in two hours, which means this iPhone will crank here with its screen on full brightness. Is it full brightness? Because it's got to be, because I'm out. Yeah, its screen has been on at full brightness. My iPhone 13 Pro Max screen has been on at full brightness for the past two and a quarter hours. And in other words, I calculated it would run for six hours. Not only is it has a screen on full brightness with the video, and it's edge to edge, I might, you can't see this, so it's edge to edge here, it's not even in dark borders. And it's been broadcasting live to YouTube, so it's been going over Wi-Fi or cellular, I don't even know which one it used, and that's the beauty of it is, I don't really care, I just hit go live, and it went live. Because it's fun to, I don't know, hang out here for an afternoon with you guys. I know you did these a while ago, maybe a year ago now, and people are loving it. My family was loving it, because they all got it, notifications, oh, you know, dad's on live. <laughs> They're like, ah, dad's. 
and they're all laughing because maybe there was a booger hanging out of my nose or something. I'm sorry, but whatever, something embarrassing like my hair today. And they're just laughing or maybe a bird. Anyway, again, I'm answering your questions live. I'm getting kind of the point that I got to go pee and it's time to, to sign off more film reviews. I know I should do that. Am I looking forward to like M11? No. Uh, <laughs> maybe some film stocks. DXL is into work with recently. Honestly, I, I haven't used DXL. I, it just, when I was in Hollywood, it was Ari, Ari and Panavision. Favorite Nikon lens of all time? You know, whatever, you know what just popped in my head? Favorite Nikon lens of all time is the ED 180 millimeter F2.8 AIS. Has optics which have never been excelled. It's built like a beautiful thing out of entirely metal. Love that lens. The other lens I love is Nikon 55 millimeter F2.8 AIS Micro, which is again, one of, my, one of Nikon's sharpest lenses ever and also built like a Swiss bank vault. None of Nikon's autofocus lenses have ever been built that well, except for a few of them that came out in the 1990s, like the 300 F4, 28 F1.4, were built like tanks, but everything else been plastic. And then lately they've been offshoring it but yeah, those AIS lenses, those are some of my favorites. Also, 35 f 1.4 AIS is a great compact little lens. Its optics are not that extraordinary, but it's phone. DXL. Oh, Panavision's DXL. Well, there you go, Panavision. I loved it. When I worked in Hollywood, I actually got to go visit the guys at Panavision who were designing and making that stuff right there up on Woodland Hills. Those guys are brilliant. I even managed to sweet talk my way to taking the camera assistance class where I got to load Panavision cameras and change lenses and, and do all that. That was fun. I love those guys. And also, if you guys are in Hollywood and get to work with Panavision, you know, if you visit their offices, I don't know if they're open to the public or not, or even to customers, but I got in because, well, <laughs> they like me there. Anyway, uh, they've got some of the old, like, 70 millimeter stereoscopic cameras, you know, dual strip, like, crazy stuff just sitting around. Because Panavision, as those of you who don't shoot Panavision probably don't realize, is they don't sell anything. They have never sold anything. It's purely a rental house. And so when they build something, they put it in the rental pool. And eventually if it blows, well, they could always rebuild stuff. But the point is, anything they've ever done, unless they deliberately run it through the crusher, it's still there available for rental. So they still have their old cameras lying around. Best Nikon macro lens, Grumman Tomcat asks. Uh, I would say go to kenrockwell.com. Go to my page called Best Nikon, Best Macro Lenses. Just go to my site, use my search box, Best Macro Lenses. Click the section for Nikon, and you'll see them all. Honestly, the best mic, but to answer your question directly, the best Nikon loan best Nikon macro lens ever is the autofocus AFD 200 millimeter F4 ED. That lens is optically perfect. It's also built like a tank from that golden era when Nikon actually made just a short period of time around 1993 when people complained because Nikon lenses are always wonderfully professional lenses. Then in autofocus land in 86, they came out with these god awful plastic things because and Nikon thought autofocus is for amateurs. Pros know how to focus, amateurs. And it was garbage. But no, actually, optically, mechanically, it's pretty good. It's just the externals were plastic, so people like, Pfft. So Nikon says, okay, show you what. Nikon is a great company. They can do whatever they want. But in photography, they've really been, haven't been wanting to make good stuff. In 93, they finally come out with a series of lenses. Let's see, there's a 20 to 35 2.8. There was a 28 f1.4. There was the 200 f4 micro, the 85 f1.4 AFD. Those were built like tanks. So yeah, the 200 AFD micro is still the very best. Kind of like the very best Canon macro ever. I have, I was showing, here's the new Canon RF macro. With this, this is the soft focus control, it turns out, when actually using it. The best Canon macro ever is the Canon 180 millimeter F3.5 L. They just recently discontinued this. The beauty of it is, I can't stick my finger out like that. The Canon 180 millimeter F3.5 L, it's all metal. It's built like a tank. It is optically flawless. At 180 millimeters, I can stand further from my subject so I don't block my light. And they look much better because when you shoot things close, like my face here, at a foot away, it looks weird. And trust me, I don't look that weird in person. If I'm further away and zoomed in, that uh, looks pretty weird there too. But anyway, this is the best lens ever. It works great on the mirrorless cameras with the adapter. And the beauty of it is that even though brand new, it was $1,800, if you know how to win at eBay, and again, I have an article on that, this one lens only cost me $550, and it is like new. So, and for $550, it's half of what a new... This is also a great lens. But for macro shooting, I don't need stabilization because I'm shooting with strobes. 
and I do need the longer focal length. Oops, hold on here. I'm trying to manage this while I'm chit-chatting with you folks here in my living room or wherever I'm shooting this. Okay. Okay. You know, I'm going to say thank you very much. I've been shooting live here for two hours and a quarter. I'm Ken Rockwell with KenRockwell.tv and KenRockwell.com. I've been doing the website for 22 years as of the 13th of this month. I love all you guys and gals. Thanks so much for watching me. Thanks for asking your questions. If you have any questions, you can always put them in the comment section of any of my YouTube videos or just email me. Go to KenRockwell.com. Click the contact page. I'm there. I love hearing from you guys. And like I said, what supports me is if you use my links to get your stuff, you're going to get to use the same world's best stores I use. And plus, they thank me, and that's what keeps me on the air here. So thank you very much. So I'm going to say, okay, Canon guy, I'm a Canon guy. Uh, I'm going to try to hang up this hang up this live YouTube broadcast directly from my Canon, not Canon, long day, my Apple, Grumman Tomcat, Grumman, Long Island, made the lem. I, gosh, when I went to school, my little friends, when I was like in first grade or whatever I was in in 1969, their dads all working at Grumman. My dad didn't work at Grumman. He worked somewhere else. But the point is, every day they come in saying, oh, my dad did this on the lem. My dad did that on the lem. And we flew that thing to the moon. Awesome. Anyway. Ah, Vancouver. Gotta love Vancouver. Thank you, guys. And we'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks again for watching.